Hey everyone, before we start this week's episode, we've got to quickly tell you that we're doing some live shows at the end of March and into April, which Woo! is which is very soon. Woo! We are doing four live do-go ones at the European Beer Cafe, Sundays at 8.30 on March 28th, April 4, April 11 and April 18. Woo! Trying to get a bit of hype Yeah, going. oh Woo! man, I am hyped. And it's not just Do Go On that we're doing live for the first ever time, Matt. We are doing some other shows too. <gasps> what? That's right. And I, as you said it then, April is very appropriate for the first ever live episode of Prime Mates. Because Ape, April. Oh, okay. Thank I, you. Honestly, yeah, did not get it. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, yeah, so that first and probably only ever live show with Nick Mason from The Weekly Planet, Cass Page from Sans Pants Radio, and Evan Munro-Smith from Gamey Gaming Game, all going to be there, and we're going to talk uh, about whatever. It's going to be fun. Even if you don't know the show, just come. Just come. <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. And then that show leads straight into your show, Dave. That's right. So Prime is at 2 p.m., then at 4.15 p.m., you can see the first ever and also probably the only ever live book cheat podcast. I'll be there. My two guests are two of the favourites of the show, Ben Russell and Michelle Brown. And we're going to have a great, Oof. great time. That There's is a great good combo. Guests, yeah. I've heard that there's going to be $100 bills taped underneath some of the chairs. Of the yeah, chair. there will <laughs> underneath my chair, Michelle's chair, but not Ben's chair. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to get a free $100 bill, <laughs> sit, sit on Dave's chair. lap. <laughs> Come down to the show. Uh, then after that, we've got Do Go On. So Sundays at 8.30, 9.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. Those four weeks, <laughs> whatever right. they are. Have you said them? The third and fourth ones, I was checking just before, I've only got like a dozen tickets left. So if you're keen to get either a season pass, which means you get three for the price of four, four for the price of three. <laughs> Fuck, why is it so hard? And uh, yeah, get on that soon because there's not many left. Mm, but that holy day, April 4, that is, well, actually is Easter Sunday, but it is also mm. a time where you can see, just to recap, Primates, end a book cheat, have a little break, go and see Matt's stand-up show, have a little break. Oh, no, actually, don't have a little break. Go straight up and watch Do Go On Live all on one day. Oh, man. I should I, You made me forget, Dave. You made me forget. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm also doing my stand-up show, new stand-up show. It's called uh, Nostalgia Was Better When I Was a Boy, and it's at the Victoria Hotel at something like 7.55. Yeah. Every night. Sunday is 6.55. Thankfully, otherwise you wouldn't make our show. Mm. <laughs> and you can get tickets via comedyfestival.com.au. Just search my name. Uh, there'll be links in the show notes here. That's right. Use so. the discount code do go on one word. Great. Hopefully we'll see you at one of those one million shows. Please. Mm. Please. Please. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke and as always I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. That's Matt. And I'm Matt. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before we meet Matt, let me tell you that this show, uh, well, it's a history program essentially. We take it in turns to report on a topic often suggested by a listener and uh, it is my turn this week to uh, give the report. You guys don't know what it's going to be about so we always start with a question. Just to get us onto that pesky little topic. And I reckon you've got a good shot at this, both of you. Okay. Especially you, Jess. <gasps> Why me? Is pesky little topic a clue, do you think? What's pesky? Know. Jack Russell's? Oh. About Jack Russell's? <laughs> yeah. History of Jack Russell's. Oh. Okay. My question is, who were the first two men to summit Mount Everest? Oh, Edmund Hillary. And? Tenzing Norgay. Yes, that is correct. Edmund Hillary <laughs> and Tenzing Norgay. <laughs> also, uh, a runner-up point for Matt there. Thank you. Uh, because Jess actually covered this five years ago on the 21st of March in March 2016 because they are the first two people, the history records, as being the first ones to climb yes, Mount which, Everest. So Jess, like you said, Jess has done this topic I already. Say, I thought we'd done this. <laughs> or were they? Oh. oh. Was it possibly George Mallory and Andrew Irvin? <gasps> oh. That's what this topic is. Wow. George Mallory and the 1924 Mount Everest expedition. I mean, obviously I remember, but um, refresh my – the people, the listeners. Yes. Edmund Hillary. He's a New Zealand. I remember that. Yes. And he when was, got to the summit yep. in – What? 19 
17. 53. 53. As we all remember we very all remem- clearly. Do you remember doing that report at all? Just oh, yes, I do, yeah. It was at the old studio. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. So a few years back. Why do I remember you got... Oh, what was... The, anyway. It was March. It was this month, five years ago, that you Get did that report. Town. Yeah. Episode 21, if you want to go check it out. Holy shit. Pretty good excuse to not remember. Yeah, five years ago. I don't remember what I did five minutes ago. <laughs> How did I get here? <laughs> Help me. No. <laughs> okay, um, wow. Yeah, so let me uh, introduce you to the main character in this story. George. 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 Also known as George, but I... George. I felt, George. I felt like he was mispronouncing his name. Georgey boy. George Herbert Lee Mallory. The name hey, rings a bell. Bitch, George bitch, Mallory. Bitch. I wonder if... Anyway, yes. Look, I will admit to you, I did not go back and listen to your episode, so there is a possibility oh, that you dog, mentioned him. Dave, dog act. it is International Women's Day at the time of recording. At the time of recording. That's and right. you have just admitted to me that you find my voice so great. No, I didn't want to hear a story of two men climbing a mountain on International Women's okay. Day. On today of all days. Even told by a woman. No, I mean, that's not... It's it one woman two, and two men. Yeah, okay. Well, one of those men is a feminist. Who? Tenzing Norgay? No, me. Oh, I'm right. a feminist. It's... Remember, I'm the feminist of this podcast. That's why I stand up for women all the time. <laughs> Have you not been? That's classic Dave, not paying attention to us. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Very disappointing. Yeah. And if I could just have a moment to praise well, Matt. Well, I think I know where you're going with this, Jess, and I like that. Um, yes, I should be praised. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll accept this prize. <laughs> well, George Herbert Lee Mallory was born on June 18, 1886 in Mobberley. Mob- Ch- Mob- Mobberley! Mobberley in Cheshire. <gasps> Gr- two oh, wow. fantastic places. Mobberley is so fun to say. Mobberley. Mobberley. Cheshire. would be a great name for a Cheshire cat. Yeah, Mobberley the cat. Mobberley. 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 Who am I kidding? Cats don't come when they're called. No, nah, God, no. Uh, Mallory came from a long line of clergymen, priests and the like, and he had... Two huh. sisters and a brother. But don't do clergymen get their produce? I mean, we ask the same thing, but in different ways. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Produce, long not long. reproduce. <laughs> I'm talking about the Poetry. first bit. Yeah. <laughs> do they produce, what, rap records? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he grew up with uh, two sisters and a brother and was raised in a 10-bedroom house. What? Which bedroom to child ratio is ridiculous. My dad was the opposite. There were eight kids in a, I uh, think, two bedroom house. <laughs> Too bad. Well, they should have moved to Mobbley. <laughs> yeah, they should have. When I was a kid, we were, we were a family of six in a two bedroom house, four kids in the one bedroom. Oof. Little bunk while. beds? Bunk beds. Hell yeah. yeah. Top or bottom? You got top or bottom? Oh, bunk? top bunk. Come yes. on, look at me. <laughs> do I look like... Living that bougie lifestyle. Yeah, oh, big time. Do I look like a bottom bunker? Absolutely not. Come on. Can I tell you about the time my brother and I fought the entire way to a... We were going away. I don't remember where we were going. Me tongue. Oh, yeah. On the beach. Yeah, we were going there and we, we argued the whole drive about who got the top bunk because we knew there were bunk beds. And we're sprinting into the bedroom to, like, shotgun the top bunk. Run in there, two sets of bunks. Oh. <laughs> Both of us get top bunk. <laughs> but are you really on a top bunk if you're not lording it over someone on the yeah, bottom that's bunk? Right. great point. I think I just like the adventure of climbing the ladder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wee! Look well, at me go. You'd love to climb Mount Everest because there's a few ladders involved. I don't want to do that. No, it sounds Dave, like Dave, stop work. trying to segue back to the topic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been deep in Mount Everest. I watched like two do- two or three documentaries on this. Oh, damn. And Two I'm- or three. I mean, that's the smallest amount. You should be able to count, right? <laughs> All right. It was two, but I thought that sounded not like many. But that's still like six hours of your life. Yeah. I mean, like four hours of your life. How many hours of your life is it really, Dave? Because you're changing that up a bit too. <laughs> All right. I watched 17 documentaries for 18,000 hours. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you for being honest, finally. And I watched it on top of a... Four bunk beds. That's, That's crazy, crazy Dave. Stacked. That's crazy. Wow. Oh, Judge. You are living. Let's <laughs> not forget. <laughs> Let's get back started. to Judge. Judge. <laughs> Judge. Going to be a long report, guys, and not because of the word count. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, at the age of 13, Judge mm-hmm. won a mathematics scholarship to Winchester College. Nerd. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's good at maths. Oh, nerd. <laughs> That's day one of him. La, 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 loser. <laughs> That's the teacher. <laughs> oh, why are you here? Scholarship. Nerd. Nerd. 
Uh, while he was a student there, one of the teachers uh, bullied him. No, recruited Mallory <laughs> for an outing to the Alps. And he developed a strong aptitude for climbing. And he was a natural. A natural climber. Natural climber. From Britannica here. Other climbers of the era noted his natural cat-like climbing ability. Oh, oh he's from Cheshire. <laughs> and his ability to find and conquer new and difficult routes. Oh, yeah, he could always find a route. Wait. And conquer it. Was he a cat? Was he yeah, a cat? He was a cat. Judge? Judge, the Cheshire cat. <laughs> That's Judge. why he wasn't the first person to climb Mount Everest. He was a cat. <laughs> cat. Still impressive. <laughs> he just dropped a cat off at base camp and said, go for it. <laughs> Up you go. Up. There's <laughs> <laughs> a mountain lion. <laughs> <laughs> well, they said to the cat, I don't want you to go up there. And the cat's like, well, fuck well, you. I'll, I'll be you. there in five minutes. <laughs> uh, after graduating from the University of Cambridge, nerd, <laughs> he became a schoolmaster. Oh, can you get even nerdier? But he continued to refine his climbing skills in the Alps and in Wales. Inside of Wales? Yeah, I mean, they're quite big. Oh, yeah, I guess you could use their rib cage as a, as a ladder. <laughs> mm. And, yeah, you should do. Yeah. PBS writes about him. He was a neat and bold rock climber and a competent ice climber, but his greatest assets were vivacity and a love of adventure. Oh, that's me. <laughs> My ears are burning. Vivacity. You yeah. are middle vivacious. name. Matt Vivacity Stewart. <laughs> he would seize the moment. This is Matt again, and encourage his fellow climbers to follow. If he had a weakness, it was the failure to recognise when he'd given enough. Would that trait come back? To bite him? I think Wait, it's going to. Can you explain that again one more time? Is this like His a weakness. classic sort of job? Yeah, I, job I, 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 type? I care too much. much. Yeah. He's, that's what they're saying. I don't know when to quit. I don't know when to quit. I just keep trying. Honestly, he, it, it is. I don't know when to quit. But when you are on top of a deadly mountain, that's actually not the best attribute. Yeah, but when you're working. <laughs> hey, mate, let's just desk. bring it back in. Yeah. Bring it back in. When you're in sales or something, actually, no, I still probably should quit when you're like harassing yeah, someone at so the house. Please buy this funeral package. Please. But to tie this back to everyone's favourite topic and make it technically part six in our series on World War I, oh my God. Mallory married Ruth Turner just six days before England entered the war. He then enlisted and served on the battlefield of the Somme in the First World War and rose to the rank of lieutenant slash lieutenant. Oh. Wow, that is wild. You, were, you purposely went out and picked a topic that didn't have anything to do with World War One, And then I'm like, well, here he is. And in, still, <laughs> in the war. You're how far into the research before you went, oh, no. Oh, for fuck's sake. Because <laughs> the famous bit doesn't mention that at all. So I'm like, I better go back and you know look into his childhood and his, young, his formative years. You're like, Fucking hell, of course he's in the war. <laughs> you pick any sort of English man from this, from this era, they're going to be there. Yeah. yeah, English, French, German, they like, ev- like yeah. what did I say, 80%? Some of those countries, yeah, crazy. From Eighteen of forty-nine or something. I definitely remember what you said in those reports. Yeah, me too. Sure. <laughs> I remember everything. So, uh, he and Ruth had three children together in 1915, 1917, and nineteen twenty. Ah, oh, come on! I'm sorry, which makes me think he was coming home from the battlefield, hanging out for a couple of days, and yeah. going back. No, I'm just up because fifteen, seventeen. It should be nineteen. You know, two years apart. Right. That's what bothered me. Yeah, because 15 and 20 felt good. It yeah. Should, should have gone fifth. Well, unless it was halfway through 1917, and that's beautiful every two and a half years. Oh, beautiful. Leah, yeah, let's say it is. Oh, that's nice. To the day. Every two and a half <laughs> years I have a kid. That's lovely. And three is a good amount of kids, and not the, too many. Well, they're still going, actually, every two and a half years since <laughs> that day. Oh, really? I told you he doesn't know when to quit. Oh, Quite a brood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. That's a lot of children. A lot of mouths to feed. Well, after the war, which if you want to hear more about, Matt just did a two-part series explaining the entire thing, uh, the Mount Everest Committee was set up to coordinate and conduct the British reconnaissance of Mount Everest. And in 1921, George Lee Mallory, our main man, George, was chosen as one of the key members of this recon team. How old was he by this time? He was born in, what, 1889, did you say? Did I say he was born? 1886. 86. So, and this is in 1930. 21. 21. So he's 35, mid-30s. Hmm. A bit over the hill, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> Get to that age. Yeah. Call it a day, mate. Does not know when to quit. What Should be you? retiring. Yeah. Kick your feet up, mate. You're going to die You've done any enough. <laughs> what are you doing? Especially back then. Yeah. You're on death's door, mate. Yeah. <laughs> what are you bloody doing going up a mountain, you goose? What are you up to? Well, I didn't know how high it was yet. What are you like? He thinks it's a hill. And he's like, I'm oh, fit. This hill keeps going. <laughs> this is nuts. Oh. 
I hadn't invented eyes that could see that high <laughs> yet. They called it Hill Everest. <laughs> it's a stupid name, it's but they really stuck with it. <laughs> so the committee's job was to explore how it might be possible to get to the vicinity of Mount Everest to note possible routes for ascending the mountain and, if possible, make the first ascent of the as-yet-unclimbed highest mountain in the world. And, really, it was all just a bit of a pissing contest. At the beginning of the 20th century, the British uh, participated in contests to be the first to reach the North and South Poles, but missed both of those. Good. A desire to restore national prestige led to scrutiny and discussion of the possibility of conquering what they called the Third Pole, making the first ascent of the highest... in my pants. <laughs> that's what I call my dick. <laughs> the highest mountain on earth. I love that. They're like, all right, so you got to the North Pole, all right, and you got to the South Pole. Well, we're going to get to the... The other pole. And honestly, it's the more important one. Yeah, this is it's, way it's bigger. It's way bigger and it's much harder, so it's even more impressive. It's real it. thick as well, actually. It's quite a chunky pole. It's not even like a pole. It's Yeah, it's like a, it's literally a mountain. Yeah. So, so. so. But anyway, very cute that you made it to that little, cute little pole. Yeah. Whatever. Walked to a pole. Oh, was that mid time was it? Mm. A little bit hard, was it? Walked, what, horizontally to a pole. Whatever, I'm climbing, I'm bitch. I'm climbing. <laughs> Say bitch. I'm hitting the vert, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but where was Mount Everest at during the early 20th century? I think it was probably still in the same spot it, it is right now. Well, Has it moved? Well, I don't think Dave would bring it up if that was the case. You're right. He's where about to where tell was something it originally, pretty... Dave? Well, in the savannah? Back then, Mount Everest was on the border of Nepal and Tibet, an autonomous region of China. The China-Nepal border actually runs across its summit point. So whilst at the top, you can simultaneously be at the highest point on Earth and in two countries. Oh, that's wow. sick. Which is kind of fun. Why didn't I know that? Jess probably did say that five years ago, but still. <laughs> that doesn't feel like something I would have added. <laughs> that's right. Geography? No, thanks. That's wild. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the Nepali name for, the, for Everest is Saga Martha, which means the head in the great blue sky. But the Tibetan name for Everest is Kwamalangma which uh, literally translates as Holy Mother. Huh. Ah. But so in the 1850s, the Brits started measuring stuff. I wanted to know the heights <laughs> of all the started tallest. with their dicks. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if my dick's bigger than that mountain. <laughs> Only one way to find out. Get the tape. That just sounds like they were bored. Yeah. Well, start start measuring, measuring stuff. stuff. <laughs> like watching paint dry. Fuck, let's measure some stuff. Well, they wanted to know all the heights of all the tallest mountains in the world. Led by Andrew Scott Waugh, who was Surveyor General of India. That's his title. That's a cool title. Uh, Everest at the time was known to the Brits as Peak 15. they are just sort of given them all different numbers. Hmm. Uh, to quote from uh, wikipedia.org. I'm not sure if you've been on this website. Big fan. Yeah, I love it. Uh, in 1849, the British survey wanted to preserve local names if possible. Uh, the, like the ones I said earlier. It's but not like the British. <laughs> And Andrew War, the British Surveyor General of India, argued that he could not find any commonly used local name as his search for a local name was hampered by Nepal and Tibet's exclusion of foreigners. War argued that because there were many local names, it would be difficult to favour one over all the others, which I guess because they have, you know, they both have different names for it. He didn't want to favour one yeah. side or the other. It kind of makes sense, but then yeah. also. So he decided that Peak 15, this makes less sense, should be named after British Surveyor Sir George Everest. Okay. So, what did George have to do with? <laughs> he was a tiebreaker. Fucking right. Hell. So you call it Kwamalunga. Okay. Um, we're going to call it Everest. That's nuts. Uh, and Sir George actually opposed the naming. He what? did not want it to be named after him. Oh my god, I'd take preferring it. Preferring more. Uh, call it Mount lo- Perkins. A local. He was thinking a local name. Uh, to make matters worse, how we all say Everest is actually not how he said his name, or how you know how I said it. Everest. Anyway. Uh, it was Everest. Oh, huh. is what he said. Everest. 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 So it's slightly different. Well, I mean, it's yeah, much of a muchness, isn't it? I think mine was better with Everay. Mm. Everay. That, that's, that's what they should have called it. Yeah, it sounds like a bottled water. Mm. Well, they could have called it. <laughs> Pass us an Everay, would you? I'm a bit parched. Yeah. I like can it. I offer you an Everay? Yes. And then please. on the cover, it can like, you can have the mountain and, all, yeah. and you'll assume it's like melted glaciers or something. Exactly. But it's not. It's just from my tap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, tap. <laughs> just tap water, and I'm making a neat little profit. Well done. I am a water tycoon. <laughs> uh, Jess, you are going to love this next bit. 
or hate it. Okay. Uh, Everest, you can never tell or, with me. It's exciting. Uh, Everest or Peak 15 was measured in 1856 to have a height of 29,000 feet. Mm-hmm. But they declared it to be 29,002 feet. Fuck you! Because they were worried. <laughs> they were worried if they announced its exact height to be 29,000 feet, everyone would assume that it was just an estimate. Yeah. So they added two more feet to make it sound more accurate. That ma- yeah, I get that. <laughs> that does make rings sense, a bell. But that is also very unscientific at the same time. Uh, because of this, the aforementioned Andrew Scott War is sometimes playfully credited with being, quote, the first person to put two feet on top of Mount Everest. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. Shut up. <laughs> that's good stuff. Yuck. Uh, in in metres, that's 8,839 metres. <laughs> but they rounded well, Dave, up. Dave, you said sometimes he's attributed. Who's attributing him? Yeah, is it you? <laughs> is that your line? That and yours? you didn't have the guts <laughs> no, to take I it wish I had that line. That is a good line. <laughs> no, it's not. That is a good line. No, it sucks. That's it, like Oscar Wilde or something. It's just like, oh, I guess he's the first man to. But an Irish accent. <laughs> to put two feet on top of Mount Everest. Good stuff. The actual height of the mountain has been disputed by Nepal and China, the two countries that share the mountain. Uh, on December the 8th, 2020, only a few months ago, it was jointly announced by the two countries that the new official height is 8,848.86 metres or 29,032 feet. Okay. So oh, they, so it's gained another 30 feet. Yeah. They've now or the, 32 feet. There's now an ag- agreement. Okay. And I believe at the time they were measuring it because there'd been an earthquake and they were wondering if it had gotten smaller. Ah. Oh. Um, but, you know, a couple of feet. Yeah. But you got to know how tall the tallest one is. You got to know. Does demand change height much? Uh, yeah. I mean, if there's seismic activity, you can bring it down a little well, bit. Well, of course, seismic activity. <laughs> if that comes into play, then obviously that'll that'll affect things. Mm. Mm. There's also there's a part up the top there called the Hillary Step, named after Edmund Hillary, that you used to have to try and that get was over. A dance movie. Used to do. <laughs> As he was climbing. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he was so good. He was crazy. Tango the whole way up. <laughs> Fox shot it down. Uh, but because of an earthquake, it's no longer there. It used to be this really hard bit to ah. to go up. It was like a sheer rock face. You had to climb at the uh, right up the top, but it's no longer there because of an earthquake. Ah, there you go. So there we go. But how about climbing the damn thing? Well, the Brits were keen to give it a crack and uh, put together the aforementioned 1921 reconnaissance mission. The primary objective was mapping and recon and to discover whether a route to the summit could be found from the north side of the mountain. Mallory was a, who's our guy? George. George Mallory. Was a junior climber on the mission, but when the two experienced climbers, Harold Rayburn and Alexander Kellis, took ill in Rayburn's case and died suddenly in Kellis' case, he had a heart attack, Mallory assumed responsibility for most of the expedition to the north and east of the mountain. It should be noted that they were, as many of these missions are, ably assisted by a large team of local people, Sherpas is one of the Tibetan ethnic groups. Uh, Sherpa originally meant people from the east and is actually pronounced Shawa by the Sherpa people themselves, which I did not know. But the term Sherpa in English in its most recent sense refers to a variety of ethnic groups in the region who have exhibited excellent mountaineering and trekking skills. So it's now used almost colloquially. Yeah, right. Okay. So any local porters, I think they're sometimes referred to, can be... Referred to as a Sherpa. Right, cool. I didn't know that, um, I guess we were kind of butchering it. Shawa. Shawa. And I could even be butchering my phonetic pronunciation, but... But hey, you, you're trying. Yeah, you know? S-H-A-R-W-R-A. Shawa. Shawa. Hmm. Yeah, and also they've done um, sort of genetic tests on people that live in that region, and because they've lived there for thousands of years and their ancestors, they actually are better at living in that high climate wow. than other people. Like they can get more oxygen out of higher altitude and stuff right. like that because they've lived that high for generations. How interesting is that? They've yeah. kind of evolved. It's fascinating how that, I know, how that happens. Amazing. In, you know, in the space of a few generations, things like that can – I mean, that's obviously over a lot of generations, but I just yeah, mean how right. things change is crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, it definitely takes more than a few generations because my skin tone has not quite acclimatised uh. to Australia. Yeah. Despite having ancestors here for a No, I fair love few burning easily. <laughs> <laughs> so George Mallory and his crew set off to recon Mount Everest. Sorry, who and his crew? George. Oh. Mallory. I thought there was this new guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> they set up to recon Mount Everest, and when he did so, he wrote to his wife, we are about to walk off the map. Oh, that's a cool line. It's a cool line, isn't it? He's got a few of these in his diaries, I'll read out. Better yeah. than Pezma put two feet at the top of the fucker. That's dumb. That is. That was written by a guy who's never climbed a mountain. Yeah. You know what I mean? This guy that's a pencil a pusher for sure. Yes. So, are you talking to me again? <laughs> no, mate. No. Yes. Uh, the 1921 trek was successful in its objectives. The expedition produced the first accurate maps of the region around the mountain, and they explored in depth several approaches to the peak. By climbing up the north saddle of the North Ridge, which in itself is still high, it's 23,000 feet or 7,000 metres, they spotted a route to the summit via the North East Ridge over an obstacle now known as the Second Step. Like that um, Mallory thing I was talking about before. Now there's two uh, sections up the top called the First Step and the Second Step, which is, you know, two sections that that you've got to climb over to get to the top. Hmm. Both quite dangerous. So they discovered a route, and the next year in 1922, they decided to have a real crack at making it to the peak. They had to go without bottled oxygen, which at the time was seen as going against the spirit of mountaineering. Oh. Survival. Yeah, they're like, against it. I mean, what's the point if you take taking Breathing, oxygen? Breathing, schmeathing. So they, these days people will do that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's Does anyone very, still do it without it? Uh, there are people who have made it up and back. Um, and it's like a record in itself if you can right. make it to the top of Everest or other very tall mountains without oxygen. Uh, people have also died trying. Right. Uh, and as we'll talk about. Seems a bit silly to, to think you can go without oxygen. But at this time, mm. I mean, no human being had ever been this high before. So including they Including locals? Including locals, yeah. Well, that they know. That, that history has recorded. Right. Yeah, because it, it is so... There's, as I'll talk about, up there it's... Referred to as the death zone. Ah, uh, okay. Because, like you were saying, um, it would make sense that some of the Shawa people, would yeah, because they've evolved lungs for yeah. that are fit for purpose. Mm. But so but even even then, even those people are not considered to have ever made it to the top right. at this point, anyway. So they are going. It is like going to the unknown. I have read some people refer to it like mountaineering nerds. They're like these people. It's it's, it's just like when they went to the moon, like they're going to this completely new place. Right. So they just caught a rocket ship up there. Pretty sure they did take oxygen to the moon, though. Yeah, at first they were like, this goes against the spirit. <laughs> of mooning. Of being <laughs> moon and earring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like to moon without oxygen. Yeah, that's just me. <laughs> Neil Armstrong's like, a suit? I have to wear a suit? Come on. That's I'm not doing it. I'm like a board shorts kind of guy. <laughs> I look so much more badass if I'm out there. Board shorts, flip flops, no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't let it all hang out. <laughs> so Mallory and Howard Somerville and Edward Norton. Who what? I can only assume Edward Norton is the grandfather of the actor. <laughs> almost reached the crest of the northeast ridge on this attempt. Despite being hampered and slowed by the thin air, they achieved a record altitude of 26,980 feet or 8,225 metres. Wow. This is without oxygen, before weather conditions forced them to turn around in the afternoon. A second attempt a few days later ended disastrously Uh-oh. when his party was caught in an avalanche that ended up killing seven of the porters. Oh, oh shit. They were having a party. Huh? Yeah. That was the problem. Yeah. The problem. Play what music. You, you know, too much bass. Yeah. In the tunes. Oh, causing the avalanche. I'm probably playing some DMX or something. Yep. Silly. Silly. Uh, second party led by Australian chemist George Finch. Jess, did your ears prick up there when I mentioned that there's an Australian chemist? Like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I love chemists. Uh, George Finch and Jeffrey Bruce. Another Australian sounding name. <laughs> Jeff <laughs> wasn't. Bruce. Jeff Bruce. Jeff. <laughs> G'day. Jeff Bruce. <laughs> G'day, Cobber. I'm Jeff Bruce. Hey, Jeff Bruce, you step aside. I'm going to climb this mountain. I'm Bruce Jeff. <laughs> you can fuck off that bottle of oxygen. I've got a bottle of VB right here. I'm <laughs> knocking it down. Off I go. Toodaloo. I wish I'd brought more than one wish I'd brought more than one bottle. <laughs> All right, all right. Come on, Skip. <laughs> He's got his kangaroo with him, What's obviously. Skip? You want me to go to the top? All right, oh. Skip. Is there a mine shaft up there? Let's go. He's also got a kelpie with him. <laughs> Bluey. Bluey. Bluey and Skipper with him, obviously. <laughs> He's not an idiot. Doesn't go anywhere without Bluey and Skip. He's wearing a cork hat. He's also got a ute with him. He drives to the top. <laughs> he drives to the top. <laughs> it was very I never cool. go any- anywhere without my Holden. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> People are like, Bruce, I don't think you're going to be able to drive that to the top. Mate, I've got a fucking V8 under there. All right? All right. You don't know what I've got a massive there. donk under, yeah. the, under the hood. Uh. <laughs> Piss off. <laughs> P- piss off, idiot. <laughs> Pulls a mug wall. Steve Steve Ward, sorry. Don't have tarnished the wrong wrong war, brother. Piss off, off, idiot. Gets into the car and starts driving up (laughs) Mount Everest. (laughs) One hand on the dash. (laughs) Listening to Akadaka. Down the strong. This one's for Bon. (laughs) (laughs) Driving to the top of Mount Everest. uh, Getting to the top and then reversing all the way back down. (laughs) How am I doing back there? (laughs) Have I got much room? So, <laughs> there's an Australian called George Finch and a non-Australian called Jeffrey Bruce. Wasted name. Uh, they reached a record elevation of 27,300 feet, 8,300 metres, using bottled oxygen both for climbing and, and as a first for sleeping. Oh. They would use it as a pillow, the tank. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Bit, t- Before bit that, sore, but good. No, better than nothing, su- though. Yeah, yeah, good neck support. I looked into these two men and uh, Jeffrey Bruce, it said... That before his this expedition, he'd never climbed a mountain. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and now, because his cousin, another Bruce, was the leader of the expedition, he'd been invited, and now he'd climbed higher than anyone in human That's history. Amazing! <laughs> oh, I thought, yeah, people tell me this is hard. I just had a crack at it and I broke all the <laughs> records. So yeah, it's not that hard. I actually hate people who do that. Oh, I haven't trained for this marathon, but yeah, I'll give it a crack. I'll have a go. And they do really well, and you're like, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> I try hard at living and I'm fucking it up all the time. <laughs> Bloody hell. And then all these other people come, babies. Just do, they're born, doing it. First day, live right through it. And fucking little believable. dogs. Those <laughs> tiny little dogs. Are you thinking of puppies? Oh, I'm thinking of puppies, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Those little dogs. <laughs> Same deal. Just <laughs> getting just... born and then living. And then they're just Even like, dogs can do it. Just, just like walking. Yeah. They walk straight away, do they? Yeah. They don't much. crawl first. Like horses. Whoa. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. It's honestly crazy. Born standing up, just like Steve, <laughs> Steve Martin. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and as for the other guy, Aussie George Finch, this is a, a bit from his bio. Finch was first married to Alicia Betty Fisher from London. By the time he returned from the front, so he was also at the war. Sorry, Matt. Uh, in 19... Don't want to get any territory here. Do you know this guy? You probably know him all. Um, <laughs> Read about him all? Yeah. Read about this guy? Seen this guy? Uh, in 1917, <laughs> he came back to find that his wife had given birth to a son from a, a relationship with another man, Wentworth Jock Campbell, an Indian army officer. That boy was the future Oscar-winning film actor Peter Finch, who's an Aussie. George separated the infant from his mother and had his relatives raise him as his own son, even though he was not the biological father. Peter did not see his parents again until he returned to Britain and found fame in his 30s. He won an Oscar for the film Network after he died in 1976. So along with Heath, Le- Heath Ledger, another Aussie, he's the only actor to win an Oscar posthumously. Huh. And that little rabbit hole is why I love researching these things. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm really like, interesting. Oh, I find out who this guy is. Oh, he came back from the war and like took his wife's baby. Yeah, why? Wait, he took his wife's he baby. Took the baby. Yeah, so he divorced I'd... the wife and said, I'm taking this baby and then wasn't his. they raised him and then he, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I know that guy because he's like the first Aussie uh, actor to win. I'm guessing Oscar. the mum was cool with him taking the baby. Fair, yeah, very sure. But they, they didn't know. He did not see his parents again until he, he went to Britney's third. Wait, the parents didn't know that he... That no, baby. Peter Finch, the actor. Oh, right. Just a little uh, little side story there. A little that, side salad. Yeah, that's a, that's a baffling story. I've heard of Peter Finch. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I guess that's why. <laughs> Good one for uh, pub trivia, that one. Good on you, Peter Finch. But uh, I just want to quickly talk about the death zone that I talked about before. Yeah. I uh, said there that on the second Everest, Everest expedition, at first they didn't use oxygen, but then they decided to use it. And that really was a game changer. These days, any height above 8,000 metres or 26,000 feet is commonly referred to as the death zone. <laughs> To the death zone. Damn. Uh, there's only 14 peaks on Earth that reach this height, and they're all in the Himalaya and uh, Karakoram regions in Asia. Oh. So they're all sort of around this part of the world, only 14. In the death zone, oxygen is so limited that the body's cells start to die. Whoa. Whoa. Climbers' judgment 
becomes impaired and they can experience heart attacks, strokes, get fluid in their lungs, brain swelling and severe altitude sickness. Yuck. I think you struggle to eat and swallow and you, you can't sleep as, and your body just starts to break down. Shit. Sometimes people lose the ability to make rational thoughts, which when you're in a deadly environment is not a good combination. Yeah. Basically, human beings aren't meant to be up there. That's fair. One what are ma- supposed to be up there? Birds? Planes? Planes. Superman. <laughs> Can Superman go up there? Can Superman a- a man on the Flash? Hmm. Uh, you got to say it probably. Can Superman out on the Flash? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, one mountaineer says it feels like running on a treadmill and breathing through a straw. I mean, just getting to the treadmill feels a bit like that yeah. sometimes. So, yeah, I get it. I'm an athlete. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Should I climb a mountain? I think you should. I do love to climb, but more like monkey bars kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I love to climb. <laughs> <laughs> I love to climb. I do. I love it. Uh, when the amount of oxygen in your blood falls below a certain level, your heart rate soars up to 140 beats per minute, which increases your risk of heart attack. And then you add, you know, strenuous exercise up there, and it is, it's hard. And the longer you spend up there, the more danger you're in. Uh, these days, the, people try and minimise how many hours you're you're actually ex- exposed to it. Bottled oxygen means you can stay up there longer and climb at least twice as fast. So it's crazy to think that Mallory and the gang got so far without oxygen on that second trip at all. Yeah. 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 Uh, sadly, that second trip was not successful. They reached a record of 8,325 metres but had to return because of faulty equipment. But Mallory decided to go for a third attempt in 1924, a culmination of his efforts in the last two expeditions. But this time he was 37 years old and he knew his window was running out. Imagine being 37 and not just curling up into a ball and waiting for death. Imagine that. Crazy. <laughs> just bonkers. Don't you reckon? Yeah. I mean, I remember being that age many, many moons ago. Yeah. Uh, I've got a second win since, but... Um, <laughs> Do you get a second win at 137? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of flips the other way. It does, yeah. I've had third, fourth and fifth wins too. Yeah. Um, and they've all been great. And now I feel oof, I feel as young as ever. Mm. I feel like a thirty-year-old. Wow, you feel that young? That wow, because that is young. Let's that put that on the record. Pretty, pretty young. <laughs> that's like let's establish that. That's a baby. Oh my God, you have your whole life ahead of you at thirty, right? <laughs> Everything that you've that's been up to this point, who cares? Just don't worry about it, right? <laughs> if you haven't achieved anything, who who cares? Don't worry about it. You got so much time. Yeah, right. You got like seventy more years, you right? Baby. Yeah, sure. Right. Well, I'd know more than that, but yeah. Thank God. But for him, he it was do or die for Mallory, is in his opinion, and he was less certain about returning this time. And it's about this time that he gave his most famous quote. <gasps> he was asked the question, why... Get a, get a dog up here. <laughs> yeah. that was Beautiful. That was, that, was one, that was one of his. Yeah. yeah, that saying we always use. Uh, that was actually from him. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. Get a dog up here. Get a dog up here. What does that mean? Well... It means when a man loves a dog very much. <laughs> Get a dog right. up, yeah. I've never really thought about it. Anyway, sorry, Dave, what, did, what was his other famous quote? Uh, his <laughs> second most famous oh. quote. Where he was asked, uh, why did you want to climb Mount Everest? And he retorted... Why the fuck not? <laughs> he said, because it's there. Shit, oh. okay. And th- th- this has been called the most famous three words in mountaineering. Because it's there. Because it's there, and that really sums up the attitude of many people. That's kind of my attitude towards cake in the fridge. <laughs> why did you eat it? It was why, there. Why did she want that fourth piece of cake? It was there. <laughs> what am I going to do? Leave it there? What? Or am I going to climb it with my teeth? I'm going to climb it with my teeth. That's what I'm going to bloody do. Are you Googling get a dog up here? Yeah. Is that even a saying? Yeah. Huh. Apparently, uh, according to outbackdictionary.com, <laughs> Uh, it says, common way of saying go fuck yourself. <laughs> also can be used as a friendly term of endearment. It has many meanings, and depending on the way it is said, could almost mean anything. <laughs> Beautiful. The Love Australian that. language. But it's funny because another, uh, an urban dictionary says it means have an alcoholic beverage. Huh. I reckon we've looked this up before. Have we? An Australian that expression is, derived that, from hair of the dog that bit you. That is really that, ringing a bell here. Yeah, that makes sense. Hair of the dog, get a dog up your like, Yeah. First beer of the day, maybe. Yeah. Drinking at 9am. A very cool thing to do. <laughs> 
such a weird thing. Like, I feel really rotten from drinking so much. I'll just keep doing it. Well, Jess, I don't no one when none of us do that. No. Well, I don't know why you're I know I'm saying that of others. Do people do that? I I believe. <sighs> Disappointing. I know. Yuck. Yeah, I'm not, I'm really awake at nine o'clock. No, God, no. But Dave, if I can interrupt you for a moment to ask a question. All right, hands on buzzers. <laughs> when you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? Uh, no. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I'm going to take your first answer, which is no. Damn it. Matt, when you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? Close and lock. Okay. Very private man. Because you don't want random passerbys looking in on you. No. Or even people in your own Let's home. Let's be honest. There's passerbys. It's me. <laughs> yeah, Dave's always What are you doing away. in there? <laughs> Can I come? <laughs> Can I come too? <laughs> so if you always close the bathroom door, why would you let people look in on you when you go online? It's the same thing, isn't it? Yes. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door. I often take a shit online. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take this shit offline. Yeah, but no one knows about it because you use ExpressVPN, <laughs> right? Love ExpressVPN. I'm all over it. Uh, you know what? ExpressVPN puts a stop to all this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device. Literally? <laughs> a tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I mean, I'm reading this off a script, but that has blown my mind. Yeah. And ExpressVPN can be used on all of your devices. It works on everything. Phones, laptops, even routers. So everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected, even if they don't have ExpressVPN. Sure that doesn't say routers? Because internet service providers, they know every single website you visit. And what's worse, they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use the data to target you. But if you use ExpressVPN, you form the tunnel, you lock those people out. I really didn't know about this tunnel thing. I mean, this is great stuff. Uh, so if you're like me and Dave and Jess and believe your... Well, not Dave. You believe your <laughs> online activity is your business. I believe that, but it's not my other businesses. Right. It's public. Yeah. Well, then secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash do go on and do it today. Use our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash do go on, and you can get an extra three months free. What? Well, that's expressvpn.com slash do go on. What a great deal. It's a great deal. I cannot believe what a good deal that is. Anyway, Dave. Do go on. Well, let me tell you about this third expedition, which took place in 1926 and was headed by the same leader as the 1922 expedition, General Charles G. Bruce. Another Bruce. What? So many Bruce's. Was that it? that was his? Yeah, he was the one that Bruce. hired his cousin, who'd never climbed a mountain, and then his cousin broke a record. There was also a main man, George Mallory, Howard Somerville, Edward Norton, known as Teddy, and Jeffrey Bruce, the cousin that had broken the record the last time. Crazy. So he did so well, they were like, "Well, get get your cousin back." And he still didn't do it. He's only ever climbed one mountain, and he did it real good. So get him in. He's one from one. <laughs> Uh, because of the devastation of the ever-present World War One, there w- were a whole lot of generation, a whole generation of young men had been wiped out. There weren't many younger men going around to join these expeditions, so they just kept using the same sort of men in their late thirties. Right. But they did choose one young man, almost as an experiment to see how he would handle the conditions, and that lucky man was twenty-two-year-old Andrew Sandy Irvin. According to National Geographic, unlike more seasoned members of the British team, Irvin had limited climbing experience, having scaled modest peaks in Norway, Wales, and in the Alps, far from the giants of the Himalaya. Oh. I mean, having said that, they got Bruce last time, and he had never climbed a mountain at all. Yeah, so... He still hasn't. He drove up in his (laughs) (laughs) ute. You want anything from up there? (laughs) You want anything from the top? (laughs) Sorry, the shop. There's a bottle up there, isn't there? <laughs> Thirsty camel, at least. Uh, he was a, a pack of Benson hedges. <laughs> uh, Irvin was a very handy young man, but I love this. Mallory later wrote home to his wife, because he kept a, a diary every day, that Irvin, quote, could be relied on for anything except perhaps conversation. Oh. Shots fired there. Yeah. What a burn. Just a bit of a dull, dull conversationalist. Yeah. He's just boring. Probably didn't associate with all these old men that he was hanging out with. Yeah. He I was know, young yeah. and cool. You know when you're young and cool and you're hanging out with older people and you're like, I can't connect to you at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Five years of this. 
<laughs> well, that's God. hanging out with his old timer. <laughs> Sometimes he says stuff, and I'm like, "What's he what are talking, you talking about? about? Do you, you even know what a Tamagotchi is?" <laughs> I really enjoy it. I love listening to the wisdom of, of, of people older than me. Hearing Who's about older their... than you? Trees? <laughs> <laughs> you whispering to trees. <laughs> tell me. Tell me about yourself. Let me learn Fucking from your leaf. They're turtles? <laughs> it's really old turtles? <laughs> no, no. I'm older than all of them. Hang so on. it's trees. It's mainly trees. Trees and coral reefs. Coral reefs? Yes, there's some coral reefs. Um, some ancient ruins. Yeah, there's some immortals out there. There are not. There are. So you stop it. Uh, Zeus. <laughs> oh yeah, you have a chat to Zeus there. Yeah, a few of the Greek gods. You like to learn from your elders, like Zeus. <laughs> Zeus, he's been around a bit. <laughs> I just like how you say it. Do it again. <clears throat> Zeus. <laughs> that is fun. Beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Just saying his name. I know, but it's, that's it's, how he says it's it. It's better than how I say it somehow. Okay. And that's rare. Most of the time, if it was a competition between you and I, me saying oh, something you're an would be official, way You're like a, an official uh, professional broadcaster. So yeah. that makes sense. Yep. Uh, Irvin was the youngest member of the crew, but he'd won the respect of his teammates and proved his usefulness by completely redesigning their newfangled oxygen gear. A gifted engineer and tinkerer, he had taken the oxygen sets apart and put them back together, making them lighter, less cumbersome, and less prone to breaking. Awesome. Having said that, by today's standards, the tanks were pretty primitive. The same size tanks in the 21st century could hold twice as much oxygen. Wow. So they just they now we just really pack in the oxygen. Yeah, that's right. We worked out a way to just cram it in there. <laughs> right. It's like vacuum sealed oxygen. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you connect a vacuum up to it <laughs> yeah. and uh, put it in reverse. Oh, those little bags <laughs> when you're putting stuff into the they storage. They look stupid, but they, they look make, so, I mean, they're very I've never, I've, I've never used one. Me Do they either. work? I don't know. You go on a holiday and you get over there and suddenly everything's in a vacuum <laughs> sealed bag. You've got to make all that room in your suitcase because you can't take the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make it. <laughs> I've got an, ent- take, an entire <laughs> bag. <laughs> Oh, I'll never be able to get the vacuum in like this. <laughs> you just keep taking pictures with your vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just check. All right, yeah. A week's worth of underpants, a few T-shirts, a uh, vacuum cleaner. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Why is that so funny? Is that funny or am I tired? No, that's funny. That's funny. The idea. <laughs> That all the space saved <laughs> by using the vacuum cleaner is taken up by the vacuum cleaner. That's else, funny. How, I mean, obviously, if you're taking all those clothes over, you're going to wear them at some point, right? How do you get them back in? you got to take a vacuum cleaner. you got to take a vacuum cleaner. Oh, that hurt my tummy. I'm going to have a time out for a bit. <laughs> they probably have different nozzles in different yeah. regions. Oh, my God. The, the European nozzle. Yeah. How do you know if you're it's staying... like a three-pronger or something, <laughs> probably. If you're staying at a hotel, how are you going to know they're going to have the, the right, the right, the right nozzle? Uh, you yeah. well yourself. Do you have Wi-Fi, a business centre, a, a vacuum, vacuum cleaner? <laughs> Australian nozzled vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. You get a vacuum adapter. <laughs> yeah. Can I... Do you have an Oceania adapter? <laughs> do you have one of those? <laughs> hmm? For the vacuum, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> not, not for the power. Also for the, the same one used in Argentina, I believe. <laughs> So their oxygen tanks were pretty primitive. So was their clothing. Advanced fabrics and materials make much of today's high-altitude gear stronger, warmer, lighter, and more reliable than the technology and clothing available to Mallory and Irvin in 1924. But their gear, heavily influenced by polar explorers, was cutting edge at the time. On the top halves of their bodies, they wore six layers made up of natural materials like wool, silk, and flannel. Basically, they look like they're walking around in tweed suits up there. That, oh, wow. That's a strong look. I love which that is, very much. These days, climbers wear modern, breathable synthetic materials with dramatically improved wind and waterproofing. You wear like a full duck down suit. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be cozy. Be like walking around in a doona. Mmm. <laughs> well, they, d- they also didn't have crampons back Snuggy. then. Snuggy. They didn't have crampons. We love crampons here. Ah. Oh. They're sort of uh, ice. For that time of boots the... or things to put over your boots, but they had leather shoes and used ice axes to cut into ice and steady themselves. Leather shoes, yeah, hmm. with a little uh, grip on the bottom, but it's just, it's not like today. Yeah, wow. They also didn't have harnesses that are employed today, but rather tied ropes around themselves that they they attached to the others. 
This meant that if someone fell, they could hope to be supported, but the rope would dig into the chest of the person supporting the fallen. These days, harnesses evenly distribute weight and are much safer. Also, modern ropes can hold twice as much weight. Wow. So back then, you really like, if you fall over, I hope I can hold you up. It's even, yeah, it makes it so much more impressive that they've gotten as high as they have with very little equipment. I mean, it's like, it's in, an insane task to undertake now with all the technology and improvements that we have. Oh, yeah, like for now you have GPS things yeah. and emergency beacons and all sorts of, like, safety material. It's still incredibly dangerous, but back then there's none of that. Nothing. And none of that. they're in suits and leather boots. Yeah. <laughs> suits. <laughs> leather boot. <laughs> what did you think of that, mate? Hmm? Did you like that? Just looked at yeah. them out for a bit of a hang. Oh, me... It was approval. I was Pat on the back, oh, please. Yeah. Please praise me. It was that. So I'm it feels like sad. a debut album title. Yeah. Jess Perkins Suits and Leather, leather boots. boots. That's good. I like that. Thank you. Uh, also, as well as the vacuum in the suitcase, they also had an entire giant film camera operated by John B.L. Knoll to document the trek. And there's actually footage that exists that you can watch online. Oh, wow. they, made a, they released a documentary about it wow. um, in the 20s. All up, they had a shitload of supplies, probably carried by 60 porters Holy that assisted shit. them. Holy shit. And the idea would be they'd set up a camp and the porters would help carry all the stuff up and then a couple of them would go up higher and have a crack and then come back down to the main camp. Right, okay. Just on their, on their own. Yep. Now, one important item that Mallory carried with him was a photograph of his wife, Ruth. Oh, my God. He is so whipped. <laughs> Oh, he's going on this um, incredibly dangerous journey, taking a what picture of the missus. <laughs> All right, yes, mate. he he probably loves her. Oh, 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 that's quite nice. New concept. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> love. Show me love. <laughs> what is love? <laughs> uh, he carried the photo in his vest pocket and told her that if he made it to the peak of Everest, he would leave it there as proof. Okay. He'd be like, technically, you did it, babe. Babe, this one's for we you. We did it together, babe. Babe, could have done it without drops you, the babe. photo and it's just blown <laughs> over the side like, instantly. Oh, I should have thought of that. Shit, should have. Should have brought some blue tack. Should have got a magnet. Yeah. Just, just a photo of the miso, boys. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. What? I love my wife. Get over it. Have you noticed how guys are saying wifey more now? It's such Ew. a weird change from miss, Mrs. or miso. I fucking hate Mrs. Hate Mrs. What I do you think? Mrs. I, I feel like I hate wifey even more. Yeah, wifey's not good. Just say wife. <laughs> The wifey. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so the rarely wifey. said in a positive way. It's always like, oh, I've got a bloody check with the miso. You know? Yuck. Hmm. Just say her name. She yeah. has a fucking name. Uh, we I mean, all know her name. But just like, okay. She's standing right there. Here's what you have to do the first time. People who have never met your wife. You say, right. my wife, Lauren, okay. whatever her name is. Your wife's Lauren. Yeah, Lauren. Lauren. You've met her. Um, and then you just use her name from then on because right. they know who the fuck you're talking about. Yes. All right, what if my wife's name is Misso? Okay. Very confusing. That is confusing. My actually. wifey, Misso. <laughs> <laughs> From that point, yeah. I can transition to Misso. Yeah. Nickname the soup. <laughs> but you're not going to call her my Misso if that's her name. No. There you go. Great, that's the difference. That's, that's how you know. Yeah. And it's a capital M. Misso and I the other day were <laughs> yeah. walking the dog. Uh, the Misso. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the difference. Yuck. The Misso. The Misso. <laughs> ah, all right. Hey, look, I think it's all in good fun. I think it's stupid, but <laughs> on should I say boyfy? What do, what is the what did what did the ladies say? Husbo, which hubby. I'm not, a, not a fan of husbo. Hubby, yeah, I don't like that. Either. Hubby's hubby gross. and wifey. That's probably the equivalent. No What's good. the equivalent of miso? I don't know. Hubbo. I don't think women do it. The old the old man. <laughs> the old man. Because the old man's your dad. Right. But I and ball and chain is only women as well. I don't think women do it. I think we just say. Husband or boyfriend or partner. Sack of shit. Sack of shit. The, the old the sack freeloader. Of shit. The old sack of shit. Yeah. <laughs> that dipstick I live with. It's. I mean, you might not say a condescending thing, but the way you raise your eyebrows when you say it gives oh, it all away. Okay. Like when you say like Greg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Greg the other day he goes. Dave's given some great brow action there. Yeah, that's some brow. lower those eyebrows. Yeah, can, can they hear that, you reckon? And Greg. Yeah. The other one. <laughs> Anyway, what are we fucking he's talking about? He's taking a picture of his wife. Right. Oh, yeah. oh my very god. Nice. Yeah, he said, and he said, "Hey, if I make it up there, I'm going to put you." It's a tribute to you. There. I'll leave it up there. Group picture mate. of the wifey. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, "Oh, my hubby's just climbing a mountain." 
Don't worry about it. He's gone there for the third time in three years. He has not been a great dad at this point. <laughs> yeah. Has not been around a the lot. children don't know him all that well, but there's a lot of money in mountaineering, I'm told. But at least he hasn't snatched him from, like... Yeah, that's yeah. right. He hasn't raised someone else's child. Uh, in June, the group... I have a funny feeling you're leaving a bit out where they needed someone to look after their kid or something. I was just reading the quote of his bio. <laughs> Okay. Putting it out there. What more can Dave do That's other than true. research? An Australian Oscar winner. Mm. It's probably the information wouldn't be out there. <laughs> or one of our greatest sons. <laughs> can you name him? Yeah, Aaron Finch. Opening batsman <laughs> and captain of the T20 side. Finchy. I wonder if he's related to the actor whose name Matt is. Oh, fuck. Peter Finch. Great work. He's got it. Um, I can't lie, Jess mouthed that to me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I actually missed the mouthing, so I, I let, wouldn't yeah, know. Yeah, you, you could have gotten away with that. All right. Well, in June, the group made multiple attempts at the summit. They would break away, as I said, from the main group in pairs and try to make it as high as they could and then rejoin the camp. Right. Mallory and Bruce went first, but bad weather made them uh, abort their attempt. Edward Norton and Howard Somerville made the next summit attempt on June the 4th. They had to leave later than they'd hoped because of a spilled water bottle. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. Many a trip has been... <laughs> I've, I've had to call the airline a few times, so you're going to have to wait, actually. I've just spilled my just water spilled bottle. Water. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's on the carpet. What <laughs> had, had it instantly frozen one of them to well, the ground yeah. or something? <laughs> oh, shit. My left arm Not again. is strapped. <laughs> Uh, so they had to pause and cut off. You're going to have to lick me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, she said instantly. Oh, no. And then he's like, oh, no. My, my tongue is now attached to your arm. Has anyone got any hot water? Oh, no. Oh, the instant regret was... Very, very good. I do have to have a time out now, I think. <laughs> That's very, I, I should clarify. The spilt water bottle makes them late because they had to melt more ice before they left because they got to have water on the trip. Right. But I read that and thought, that's very funny. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, ready? Phone keys, wallet, water bottle. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. You're going to have to wick me out. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, we're having a lot of fun here. Uh, so they went they went alone along later than they expected because of the water bottle incident. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, Edward Teddy Norton alone reached eight thousand five hundred and seventy two meters before he abandoned the attempt. This was an especially epic climb considering that due to a mechanical malfunction, he had to do it without any oxygen. Ah. This was a record height without oxygen which stood for the next five decades. Oh, wow. Until 1978. Shit. Wow. The highest anyone had ever been. He's like, well, I've lost my water bottle. Oh, the oxygen's not working. I'm just going to have a go. What was the full height again? It's 9,000 something, was 8, it? 8,000. So they're close. Yeah, it's close, but I must say, you think, oh, there's only 300 metres extra to go, but right, that, that's it's uphill. The heart, the, oh, close it's to the, the top. Part, yeah. right. Yes, it's very, very difficult. It's not like you just, like, just run the last 300 metres. Here's what I was just thinking. It's 8,840 metres. Right. So Edward Norton does this very impressive thing way back when, but any time somebody tries to Google him to find out more information, <laughs> yeah. the actor very comes annoying. out. A guy who's not climbed a mountain, I assume. He's never climbed a mountain, I assume. He portrayed a neo-Nazi. I assume. And a guy who d- drove in a mini mine, mini Cooper. And a guy who in Italy. got green when he was mad. Yeah. What about you Google Donatello and a Ninja Turtle comes up? Ugh. You'd be pissed off if yeah. you were a sculptor. Like, fucking hell. Oh, come on. Get your hand off it. Turtle. He's the nerd one as well. He'd be shattered. Yeah. Like, I'm not even the, the cool one. Donatello <laughs> is the cool one. He's the nerd. Oh, yeah. Which is so cool these so days. So cool. Uh, Intelligence is cool. I wish I was intelligent. <laughs> Me too. Mm. I also wish you were intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a pretty face over here. Wow. <laughs> Lucky I'm gorgeous. <laughs> Lucky. I'm going to keep trying to explain things to you. Yeah. No, don't give up on me. <laughs> keep trying, but probably just be a pretty face forever. I guess that's it for me.
<laughs> Just that beauty. Is my value. <laughs> <laughs> Just a hottie. <laughs> Wasted on a podcast. What a curse. Yeah. So the first two attempts they had to abort. The third and final attempt on this trip again involved our main man, Georges Mallory. And he surprised everyone when he chose to take as his partner, not one of the older and more experienced climbers, but our young and inexperienced student, Andrew Sandy Irvin. Oh, he's come around to him a bit, has he? Yeah, well, there's debate as to why he chose Irvin. The most logical, it would seem, is because he was the best with oxygen bottles. And Mallory knew that they're going to make it the secret is oxygen that works. Right. Also, this other kid is young. He's very strong and apparently very brave. Great. Some it's of the, not good conversationally. Just not great conversationally, but everything else. He's gung ho. When one of the documentaries I was, uh, I watched on it was saying that uh, Mallory had marked up all the other guys and thought, even though they're experienced climbers, I reckon when it came down to it, some of these other guys might sort of freak out a bit or say, "No, let's not keep going. Yeah. Let's go back." Right. But he reckons this young guy was gung ho, and if Mallory said, "Let's keep going," he'd go. No worries. Right. And you know what? Like, if, if he's not a great conversationalist, who cares? You, you, you're mountaineering with him, not dating him. Yeah. It actually feels like, a, you know, when you're doing something really hard, and people are like, I don't want to talk right now. Yeah. Ever, like, I'll occasionally do one of those sort of fun runs or, and pe- there are people chatting. I'm like, oh, I'm just really struggling yeah. to keep yeah. breathing. Just eye on the prize. Can you here. just sh- shut the shut fuck the up? Shut the fuck up. Yeah. In this case, you're just like, I want this guy to just know what he's doing. You don't, you don't need to have a chat. So that sounds like a good yeah, plan. I don't want to talk at all unless it's about carabiners mm. and I'm going to fall to my death, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's all I want to talk about. <laughs> so on the evening of June the 5th, Irvin and Mallory camped at 23,000 feet on a narrow snow saddle connecting the north face of Everest. They were getting ready to make one last push to the summit the following morning. They had their oxygen. They had their VPK vest pocket Kodak camera ready to take photos at the summit to prove that they'd made it. In his diary, the younger Irvin wrote that his fair skin had been cracked and blistered by the sun. He wrote, quote, My face is perfect agony. Have prepared two oxygen apparatus for our start tomorrow morning. Oh, man, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. No one so, thought to take any SPF. Sunscreen. Sorry, guys. you gotta, you got to wear it, even on an overcast day, guys. Jeff Bruce would have been wearing an Akubra. Yeah. He would have been all right. <laughs> Keeps away the sun and the flies. Yeah. He's got little corks on it. Oh, no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many flies up there in Everest. <laughs> uh, the next morning, to quote from the wire.in, an Indian website with a th- great three-part article on uh, this expedition, on June the 8th, 1924. Nearly 30 years before old mate Tengay. Yeah, almost exactly three decades. Tenzing, Tenzing Norgay. Tenzing Norgay, sorry. And uh, the Kiwi... Edmund. Edmund. Hillary. Hillary. Why can't I remember those names? And that actor's name is? <laughs> Peter Finch. Great. Oh, <laughs> all right. Just didn't mouth at that time. Ten Zig Norgay. Edmund Edmund Hillary. Hillary. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> We've got to remember, I'm as old as the sea. So, <laughs> <laughs> so June the 8th, 1924, at 8,140 metres, they stepped out of their tiny two-man tent closed the flap, secured it, and donned the heavy oxygen apparatus. Turning towards the summit of Mount Everest, they climbed into the unknown on a route no human being had ever (laughs) trounced. I'd believe that as a word if you just committed to it. I have combined two words there, which is trod since Mount Everest was created. Tronced. Tronced. I tronced off into the darkness. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and uh, Peter Finch, he tronced the boards. <laughs> Very good. The pair's expedition mate and support climber, Noel O'Dell, stopped at around 26,000 feet on June 8th, 1924. Just after they'd left, he turned his gaze towards the summit. A thick, cottony veil had obscured the upper reaches of the mountain, but at 12.50pm, the swirling clouds lifted momentarily, revealing Mallory and Irvin moving expeditiously, he later wrote, upward about 800 feet from the summit, Odell reported. This is a quote from him. My eyes became fixed on one tiny black spot silhouetted on a small snow crest. The first then approached the great rock step and shortly emerged at the top. The second did likewise. 
Then the whole fascinating vision vanished, enveloped in cloud once more. Wow. So he's watched them go out there and he thought it was the second step, which means they're very close to the summit. And then nothing. <gasps> That's right. This is a mystery oh, episode. Wait, what? I guess that makes sense because it's like either... Either they did or they, they didn't. They did it or they didn't. Yeah. So this is sort of like that... Um, yeah, that sort of funny middle ground where no one knows. Whoa. Well, so o- they possibly did do it. Well, Odell was the last man to see them alive. He went to various camps up and down the mountain, hoping to find a sign of the two men. But he found nothing at Camp 6, which is very high up in the mountain. He laid six blankets and a cross on the snow, which was a signal to the people down below. No trace can be found. Given up hope. Awaiting orders. Shit. Then he walked all the way to the top. Couldn't see him there. Walked back down. <laughs> Couldn't see him anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thought, you know where I'll be able to see everything? Yeah. The yes. top. Get a bird's eye view. So I walked up there, had yeah, a look had around. around. Took a few snaps, obviously. Nothing. Why wouldn't you? Nothing. Couldn't All I could see, one V8 Holden. Yeah. <laughs> Doing doughies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Australian culture. Well, back home in England, word soon spread and Mallory and Irvin became national heroes. Magdalena College, one of the uh, constituent colleges of the University of Cambridge, where Mallory had studied, erected a memorial stone in one of its courts, a court renamed for Mallory. Uh, The University of Oxford, where Irvin studied, erected a memorial stone in his memory. And in St Paul's Cathedral, the massive one in London, a ceremony took place which was attended by King George V and other dignitaries, as well as the families and friends of the climbers. So at the time, huge news. Wow. Whole country knows who these two men are. Tragically, Irvin's parents, he's the younger one, left their pa- their back door open for three years afterwards just in case he came oh, home. Isn't that sad? It's also a bit unsafe. <laughs> Leave it unlocked, sure, but not wide open. It's wide open. Um, God, anyone can just wander If he makes in. it all the way back to your house, he can probably open the door. And, and, or knock. <laughs> and especially if you keep saying that to the papers, oh. we've left the back door wide open. And you reckon open. someone's... That's really sweet. That's yeah, very heartbreaking. Sorry if she's, still lis- if she's listening. Sorry to tease you a bit there. You did. I mean, it's no, a beautiful it's re- gesture. You're right. It's very heartbreaking. Very sweet. Just the hope. It quickly became one of the greatest mysteries of the 20th century. What happened to George Mallory and Andrew Irvin? Did they make it to the summit before they disappeared? A feat that would mean that they beat Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary by nearly 30 years. Wow. In 1933, a clue appeared. Some nine years after the disappearance of Mallory and Irvin, Percy Wynne Harris a member of the 4th British Everest Expedition, discovered an ice axe around 8,460 metres, about 20 metres below the ridge and some 230 metres before the first step. The Swiss manufacturer's name matched those of a number supplied to the 1924 expedition, and since only Mallory and Irvin had climbed that high along the ridge route, it must have belonged to one of them. It was speculated that it might have been dropped in a fall. It was later confirmed three decades later in 1963, to belong to Irvin because of distinctive marks on the handle. Right. So they're like, huh, that's the young guy's ice axe. Wow. Why did he drop it? What happened? (gasps) A bear. (laughs) Really? Could have been a bear. Bloody hell. Up there, bear up there? (laughs) You'll have to look me out. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Because the concept... The mental image I was it was funny, and yeah. then I realised why. Do you think like an arm? <laughs> just lick, lick the around eyes. the arm. That's funny. Yeah, but what you said, <laughs> quite a bit more graphic. <laughs> uh. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> just let you sit in that moment, Jess. Uh, in May 1991, a 1924 oxygen cylinder was found, 8,480 meters. 20 metres meters higher, 60 metres clo- closer to the first step than the ice axe, meaning that that was the minimum height the pair had reached. They're like, oh, they must have gotten this high because the oxygen wouldn't have gone uphill. Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. Unless it was helium. Oh, yeah. Was it helium? Yeah. A kind were, of oxygen. They were doing funny voices up there. <laughs> Look at me. I'm on top of the mountain. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm going to make it up here. <laughs> I'm not very good at conversation, but, geez, I've got a funny voice. Yeah. Hey, lick me out. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, according to PBS, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> in between these two th- discoveries, in 1975, a Chinese climber named Wang Hongbao 
Wang Hongbao left his tent at Camp 6 on Mount Everest and went for a walk. What? He was gone for about 20 minutes. He goes for a fucking walk when you're on Mount Everest. Just clearing his head. Yeah, Wang, what are you doing? During which time he came upon the body of a climber that he later described to a fellow climber as being, quote, an old English dead because of the vintage vintage clothes Ah. the body was wearing. No other English climber was known to have died at that elevation on Everest, so it is presumed that the body could be that of either George Malley or Andrew Irvin. Wang revealed his find only four years later in 1979 during a Japanese expedition on, on Everest when he confided his story to a fellow climber. Oh, he didn't tell anybody. Didn't tell anyone at the time. Oh. Climbers are different, aren't they? They're just a different breed of people. Yeah. What? Like you're seeing dead bodies and you're not mentioning it to anyone. Yeah, mention it. Because then you could take someone there and go they, there. That's just isn't that something they just see? They just know that there's, they're probably climbing of, over bodies. Yeah, honestly, up it's there, too hard to bring them down. These days, there's so many up there. Isn't that and, wild? And this is illustrates how dangerous it is. Tragically, so he tells this Japanese man, 1979. Oh, you know, I once saw this uh, English dead man up here. Tragically and frustratingly for the mystery, the very next day after telling someone. Wang was killed in an avalanche, so no more is known about his find. So no one could interview him or get any more figure out where about. clues it was, yeah. Because isn't that amazing? You'd think, oh, it's, you know, it's, you just go up and find these bodies, but they'd be, it'd be every chance is buried under snow, depending yeah. on the weather, and uh, it's fall also into so a, hard to move around. And, yeah, and they can fall into a hole or in a cre- uh, crev- crevasse. Yeah. Which, a crevasse. You know, they Before could be wearing a cravat. A cravat. Mm. Austin Powell. He's like, hmm, I don't, I don't think he was wearing a cravat. If mm. someone's put a cravat on him, mm. they'll never find him. They're like, that's mm. probably someone else who wasn't wearing a cravat. And if you needed a little drink, you could have a carafe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of options here. <laughs> In 1986, Tom Holzell, a man who had dedicated his life to solving the mystery, led the first team to look for Mallory and Irvin. He had narrowed his search down to a specific spot he thought Mallory's body might be. Sadly, his team were hampered by heavier than usual snow and had to come and came back empty-handed. Sadly, the mystery remained. What year was that? 1986. Shit. Wow. But this mystery captured the imagination of so many people over seven decades. Like, if you're in the climbing community, at the, everyone knows this story. Why don't they just send up a drone? Oh. Or just go up on a helicopter? Yeah, have they thought about that? Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about drones. Oh. <laughs> Am I, are you guys picturing this? Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay see them at the, the peak of the mountain. Oh, they're up there dead. And they go, they're both at the very peak. And they push And they go, <laughs> they sort of look at each other, don't say anything, and then just kick them off It's the a bit side. of a nudge. Yeah. And they say, Into a, a, whoops. A cravat. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't even say whoops. They just wink at each other. And they, yeah, they never speak of it again. Never they speak they of shake it again. hands yeah. and they take the photo on top. And they yeah. look each other out. If you look in that photo. <laughs> in celebration. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, if you zoom in the background of that photo, you can see a body whizzing down the <laughs> whizzing. mountain. <laughs> it's got whiz lines yeah. behind it. Well, that thing's whizzing at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> but so everyone, if you're into Everest or climbing, everyone knows this story. Captured the imagination for people for seven decades and its fascination persisted. In 1999, the Mallory and Irvin Research Expedition was put together. Sponsored in part by the TV show Nova and the BBC, the goal of the expedition, led by Eric Simonson, was to discover evidence of whether George Mallory and and Andrew Irvin had been the first to summit Mount Everest. In 1999. 1999. Far out. So this is like 75 years later. Yeah. Using the clues that had been found over the decades, the ice axe, the oxygen canister, Wang sighting of an English body, they hoped they could narrow down the search area. Hmm. They're like, all right, put these clues together. The ultimate hope was to find the bodies and then the camera that could hopefully prove if the pair had taken the photo up there before they died. If they were to find the bodies in camera, it would be one of the biggest discoveries of the 20th century. So it was, de- it was decided that they should implement a code to use over the radio in the event of making the find. The code word boulder would be used if they'd found Mallory or Irvin's bodies. 
Oh no! What, what if happens? Just if a boulder. They find a boulder. I also thought, what are you doing? That's like what, there's a boulder rolling down. Unrelated. Yeah. So say like a honking clown yeah. nose yeah. or something. Yeah. If uh, all right, if I've made the, I'll yell avalanche, avalanche <laughs> three times. <laughs> I'll yell I'll add, code please, red, code save, red. Save me! I'm dying. <laughs> Tell my family I love them. Oh, he's found something. <laughs> The climbers found an oxygen bottle from the 1975 expedition that Wang, who had spotted the so-called English dead, had been a part of. So they knew wow. they were, they're like, Wang was here? Yep. Even that is, would be fascinating. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like yeah. they're unearthing these sort of recent history archaeological digs almost. Yeah, and like because there'd be so many oxygen tanks would, up there. Wouldn't they be quite preserved up in that climate? Yeah, because it's so cold all the time. And not, you know, um, not many bugs and... Uh, other animals right. that would eat stuff. Yeah, of course. So they knew they were in the right area, and the group of climbers spread out to cover more ground. Up until this point, the expedition had taken five weeks, so they've been up there a long time. Within hours of searching, American climber Conrad Anker found something. <gasps> and let me just say, boulder! Oh, he found a boulder. I <laughs> forgot what that means. Does that mean boulder? No way. He'd found a frozen body. At 26,760 feet, 8,157 metres on the north face of the mountain, he had just found George <gasps> Mallory. Sorry, been, Dave, who? <laughs> George Mallory, who'd been lying out in the open for three quarters of a century. Oh, wow. my God. Oh, I know. Wow. How's he looking? Was he alive? Well, first, yeah, he was, he was sadly deceased. He'd missed him by a couple of minutes. Damn it. Oh, it's always a way, isn't it? So heartbreaking. So now he had to tell the others of his discovery because they've spread out. So he gets on the radio and he told the New York Times, Boulder was the code word for body. So I sat down on my pack, got out my radio and broadcast a message. He said, last time I went bouldering in my hobnails, I fell off. He said it was the first thing that came to mind. I just, just say th- boulder, you fuckhead. <laughs> I just threw in hobnails because of an old hobnailed boot, the kind that went out of style back in the 1940s, was still laced onto the dead man's right foot. Was it? Why, why couldn't they just say we found the body? Yeah, just say, hey, you're gonna me, say, boulder. I don't understand. Oh, they want to, like, other people, you know, attract attention. Okay. Apparently, his friend only heard the part where he said hobnails. <laughs> He's like, I could see him 50 yards above me and away to the east. Jack, Jake sat down, ripped out his radio and said, what was that, Conrad? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, he just, he's like, just come over here. Get over here. This is such a weird system. I know. <laughs> but they shared the discovery. I went bouldering in my hobnails. <laughs> Are you what? okay, mate? Um, Do you need oxygen? Yeah, you at, sound like you're losing Yeah, it. at this height, you really can become delusional. Yeah. Uh, the dead man was definitely George because a label sewn into his sh- shirt even bore his name. Gerge. It's he. They checked and it said Gerge Mallory. Wow, Gerge. Wow. He was in a way quite mummified. The freezing conditions of the mountain had kept him relatively intact. Conrad Anker, who found him, recalled he lay face down, head uphill, frozen into the slope. A tuft of hair stuck out from the leather pilot's cap he had on his head. It seemed likely that he was still alive when he had come to rest in this position. There were no gloves on his hands. In National Geographic write, Mallory's entire back was exposed. The reserve skin so clean and white that it looked like a marble statue. His back wow. was exposed. Yeah. So the clothes had worn away or that might have happened at the time? Oh, I think the clothes have worn away there. Right. Wow. Interesting. A severed cord tied around his waist had left rope marks on his torso, so it would have dug in really deep. Yeah. Oh. A clue that at some point Mallory likely had taken a hard, swinging fall. And there is fascinating footage online that I watched because it was in a documentary, which Jeez, I watched. you're very proud of watching two documentaries. No, I, I only say this because I watched it before I read the family were upset that the video of this of oh, his body was released. Yes. So it's up to you whether you search it out or not. It is very much like they describe. It's he, it looks like a mannequin because it's like a like a plastic. His back is white he, and exposed. He, wow. His family would be his who, like, like. Did he have kids? Yeah, he yeah, had three, three children. Yeah. So right. it'd probably be his oh. grandchildren and great grandchildren. Jeez, yeah, that. Oh, how sad for the kids. Just a miss to not know for so long. Never knew. Yeah. Were they around still? I guess I'm not sure if they. I think one of them was alive, but the other two. Because they'd be in their, you know, 80s themselves. Yeah. Because yeah. that would be some sort of closure. 
Yeah, because you know kind of what happened. Amazingly, Mallory's body was just 100 feet away from where Tom Holzell had been looking in 1986. Remember, he's the guy that went out, dedicated his life to finding it, but then went out and it was too snowy. Oh, shit. He was close. 30 metres away. <gasps> that was the body. So oh, he was wow. in the right spot. So in 1999, part of the biggest mystery of the century had been solved. The team searched around, but sadly there was no trace of the camera. This or Sandy? Had, well, this has led many Everest historians to conclude that Irvin must have been carrying it. This makes sense considering he was the better photographer and would have known the British public would want photos of the older and more famous Mallory. Yeah. So he'd be the one taking the photo oh, of yeah, Mallory. Yeah, can't do sense. selfies back then. Hmm. Another thing. Both th- in there. Get a selfie stick, idiots. But another thing that adds to the mystery, notably absent, was a certain photo of Ruth. Oh, oh. which he was going to place at the yeah. top of the mound, And it was not found in his vest pocket. Does that mean he'd oh. made it and left it up there for oh. her? Or does it mean it had disintegrated over 75 years? Oh. Or had he brought it out in his dying moments as look at it or something? And it's flown, it's and it flapped flooded away. away. Or has someone else find the body and taken the photo out in those decades? Who knows? Wow, that would be a weird thing to have done. (coughs) Yeah, that would be weird. Uh, What was found in his pockets was Mallory's green-tinted goggles, leading people to speculate that he was descending at night when he wouldn't need them. His wristwatch had stopped between 1 and 2, but they can't be sure if it was a.m. or p.m. Right. Trying to narrow it down. How How long were they alive after Odell saw them up there in the mist? Right, yep. It was determined that and he... does the watch stop... When you die. When you die? Yeah, watches are connected to your heart. Or is it back then you had to wind them? Yeah, winding so you could trace it back. Or it might have been damaged in the oh, fall, okay. that kind of thing. It was determined that he died from injuries sustained in a fall. He had fractures on his right leg, but the lack of extreme injuries indicated that he had not tumbled very far. His waist showed severe rope jerk mottling... Great word. Showing the two had been roped together when they fell. It's speculated that he and Irvin had been tied together. One of them had fallen, and after not being able to pull the other one back up, they cut them loose. But they're not sure, <laughs> which is brutal. <laughs> That's fucking brutal. But also probably necessary. Yeah. Uh, before leaving the site of Mallory's death, the expedition conducted an Anglican service for the climber and covered his remains with a can, which is like a pile of stones. So they sort of buried him up there. But what about his younger partner, Sandy Irvin? Sadly, his body was not discovered in the vicinity. Mm. Zhu Jing was deputy leader of the Chinese expedition that made the first ascent of Everest's north side in May 1960. He later claimed that after bailing from the summit attempt, he was taking a shortcut down through a yellow band when he spotted an old dead body inside a crevice at approximately 27,200 feet. At the time of this sighting, the only two people who had died this high on the north face of Everest were Mallory and Irvin. Because they now know where Mallory was, had he spotted Irvin. Right. So in 2019, a National Geographic expedition that included Mark Sinot, who read a great article that includes an account of their Everest journey and has photos, is truly fascinating, and he actually made also one of the documentaries, and I'll link to both of those. Because the footage is its awesome. Wow. They went looking in the area that Zhu Jing described in 2019. So not that long ago. They had a group of drones, Jess. Okay. Fly around searching the crevices for the body of Irvin. They didn't find it, sadly. And it's presumed that his body and the camera is still out there somewhere. Wow. Oh, no one out luck. We're probably going to... We're putting this out in the universe. I'm really hoping that in like three weeks it turns up. That does that does happen. Some of have done yeah. episodes where soon after a movie's announced about it or, yep. or you know, deep, you know some of the mysteries are, are, are almost solved. Forrest Fenn's treasure was found. Yes. D.B. Cooper, you know, continually has updates. Yeah. Zodiac Killer, sort of things. Let's put that out into the universe. So they didn't find it in 2019. Sadly, the tally for deaths on Everest greatly increased that year with 11 people dying on the summit. And a lot of the time, as Matt mentioned, the bodies have to be left up there on the mountain. In fact, nearly 300 people are known to have died on Everest. Nepal's government estimates that most of them, perhaps 200, remain up there. 200 bodies. Yeah. Hmm. Nearly half the people who have died on Everest have been Sherpa guides too. Right. Shit. The reason they're left there is because of how dangerous it is to transport mm. a heavy weight at that level. 
To quote from an article on All That's Interesting, when someone dies on Everest, especially in the death zone, it's almost impossible to retrieve the body. The weather conditions, the terrain, and the lack of oxygen makes it difficult to get to the bodies. Even if they can be found, they're usually stuck to the ground and frozen in place. Right. Well, Jess, you have a suggestion there? <laughs> How could we possibly remove them? Hair dryers. Oh. Defrost them a little bit. That's clever. And just scoot them down. Where? Dro- uh, ride them down. Ride them down. Lick them out and ride them down. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> Write them down hard. <laughs> mm. And fast. Yeah. So there's a lot of bodies up there, including presumably Irvin, but some of the bodies have even become well-known markers for other climbers. The most famous example is nicknamed Green Boots because the man is wearing bright green boots. That makes sense. The body is curled up, lying on his side in a limestone alcove cave that nearly all climbers who reached the summit pass by. About 80% of climbers, it's estimated, take shelter in the same cave that the man died in on their way up because it's right near the top the identity of green boots is highly contested but it is most widely believed that it is a uh, siwang peljor a 28 year old indian climber who died in 1996 during a controversial season where 12 people died in 2014 it was noted that the body of green boots had disappeared possibly being pushed over the side buried or retrieved but there are reports of it having reappeared in 2017 what but that's the most famous dead body up there. Right. And there's a, um, you, can, you can Google a photo of it, and it's not graphic because it just looks like someone lying there in their, their gear. And that's the most amazing part of it is it looks like that he could have been there for five minutes, someone taking right. a nap, but really it's been there for a quarter of a century. Wow. Just, just lying there. Wow. So there's hundreds of bodies up there. Green Boots is just one of them. Irvin is probably one of them. Somewhere out there. Dave. That is a grim fact. Is that grim? <laughs> yeah. Matt can Matt can tell us. Yeah. Here's another grim fact. Overall, the death to summit ratio is about four percent. So four percent of people that go up there do die. The question is, would you climb? Yes, Jesse just brought up a picture of green boots. Doesn't it just look like a guy that's just lying there in the snow? Yeah, yeah, right. Very nineties too. So <laughs> I, I reckon they might be right. That's. I don't incredible. think I would. I definitely wouldn't do it. No, absolutely not. There was a point when I was researching this going, oh, my God, it's so cool. It's, and then I watched the, I, got, I keep talking about it, the documentary. <laughs> it is so terrifying looking. Yeah. I don't, yeah, it's not the terrifying bits. It's just the, it's the brut- brutality of it. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, I sleeping in ice cold, no. <clears throat> struggling to breathe. And also, I didn't realize this because I looked into, if, if you want to go there, it's very, very expensive. Uh, you go there, and it's not just like you go there on a tour and you walk up it. Yeah. Most people that summit go there for two months because you've got to go to the base camp, which itself is very, very high acclimatized. You go up a little bit, you get ready to get acclimatized to that height, then you come back down. Yeah. And you go up a little bit further, so yeah. you, can, you go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And in some seasons, there's usually about a week, it's usually in about May, where the conditions are perfect. Or, well, better than usual to climb the top. Wow. Some seasons there's only one day or a few hours where the weather is good. So you just have to wait it out for that weather. Right. Because it's so tall, it's like up in a jet stream. So there's crazy winds and all sorts of terrible weather up there. And that's why you sometimes, a couple of years ago, a photo went viral of all these people. There's like a line of people to the top. Yeah. And I saw that and went, what the mm-hmm. fuck? And, it's, and I thought it was like that all the time, but that's because those people have all been waiting for like the one day. Right. So the 200 people that are going to climb that year all go, shit, we've got to go now. But that's actually made it much more dangerous because there's a, people get stalled at the top. So now they spend more time in the death zone. Yeah, right. And the more time yeah. you spend up there, the more... And they're like, I'm not bailing. The the conditions are turning, but I'm so close. Yeah, yeah. and that's what people... They get stubborn and they get up there or they, they go, oh, I'm about to lose the light, but no, I've, I've got to go. I'm really close. And they get up there. It, it's too dark or yeah. the conditions suddenly change and they just can't make it back. So more people die on the way down right. having made it than on the way up. Wow. Which is so scary. Would you have good Wi-Fi at the top though? Yeah, yeah. Like great. could you at least post the selfie? Yeah, before. So if you die on the way back, it's like who cares I made it. I reckon like you'd be like all like um, airdropping your photos to everyone. So if one of you died, yeah. the others could at least upload the photo for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get good the Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi for Wi-Fi. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but that is uh, George Mallory and uh, Andrew Irvin. That's nuts. So still not sure. We're not sure if they made it or not. 
No, we'll never know. Well, Do, what, we might. What, what, what do they think? It seems like probably not, or is it? Or is it split? It's difficult to say. So a lot of people. So the guy that saw them, Odell, he s- swore at the time that he saw them at the second step, which is very close to the top. Right. If you get to that level, they're thinking they probably would have made it. Right. Later on, he was like, I'm not so sure. Maybe it was the first step, which is quite, quite a, a lot bit. further back. Yeah. Well, it's not that. F- in meters, it's not that far, but it's just a lot more difficult. Yeah. People have factored in. They're like, all right, if they made it to the second step, they probably could have made it. First step, not so sure. Yeah. If if they made it and fell on the way back down or if they bailed because of the conditions and then fell on the, back, on the way back down. It's just, yeah. Until we find that camera. Yeah. Right. Which we probably never will. And do they think that uh, the f- photos, w- the film would have survived this Yeah, time? apparently Kodak have said there's a chance that it, they could develop if the camera's found. Wow. Oh, great. They're not guaranteeing it, but if it's kept in, in certain conditions, they say, yep, yeah, there's a possibility. It, so yeah. fingers crossed one day, Irvin's body turns up <laughs> with a camera. That's a great camera. story. Thanks so much for telling it, Dave. And that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show, the Fact, Quote or Question section, which has a jingle, I think, goes something like this. Fact, Quote or Question. Ding! He always remembers the ding. Now, to get involved in this, you go to patreon.com slash pod or dogoonpod.com and you sign up to the Sydney Schoenberg Deluxe Memorial Edition <coughs> Rest in Peace level. Uh, there's many levels you can get involved in. There's all sorts of rewards for supporting us. Uh, all our supporters keep this show running. There's bonus episodes. We do three per month. We're about to record one straight after this, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, there's mini reports. Uh, there's all sorts of things. There's a series about Bre- the movies of Brendan Fraser. Fraser. Uh, and you can also vote on topics. You get into the Facebook group. You get the newsletters. You get the tickets to live shows for cheaper and before anyone else. Yeah, there's heaps and heaps of uh, cool stuff, So, and we appreciate everyone who gets involved, but these four people I'm about to uh, read from are all in the Sydney Scheinberg level, and they get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. They also get to give themselves a nickname. Now, uh, first up, we've got Aidan Coglin, who has given himself the nickname Associate, or the title, I should say, the Associate Director of saying nice upon any mention or <laughs> citing... <laughs> Of 69, and also ensuring all titles within the organisation are kept short and concise and easy to remember because otherwise we might run out of space on our business cards and that (laughs) wouldn't be ideal. Really, would it? Hang on. Can you have a question in a title? I'll look into it. And procurement. (laughs) Thank you so much, Aiden. Bit of a a use of irony there. Yeah, A bit of fun. Uh, Now, Aiden has given us a... Fact. And as long as his title was, it looks like he's gone long on the fact as well. Here we go. So you guys were talking about coincidences at the end of the Franz Ferdinand episode. Here's one for you. On the day I was born, my dad was 30 years, 5 months and 18 years old. 11,127 days in total. On the day my son was born, I was 30 years, 5 months and 18 days old. 11,127 days in total. Both my son and I, are fir- I mean, that already is a great. That's awesome. Just that is cool. Is there more? There's more. There's a, Yeah, there's more. Here we well, go. Well, I mean, if, the, if 69, 69 had been involved, is the only way it would have made it Yeah, that would have made it nicer for sure. Uh, I should say I don't read these, so I read them. So I'm, I'm being blown away in real time <laughs> here. Uh, he goes on to say, both my son and I are first born, so my dad and I became fathers at the exact same stages of our lives. And whatever age my son is, I'm the same age as my dad was when I uh, when I was the, at that point. Sorry, yeah. it's a fumble over it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's amazing. That's yeah, because awesome. you think about it and be like, oh, what was dad doing this time? Uh, which is really nice and has helped me in a way I didn't really expect. We only copped it by chance when we were out for dinner for my 30th. My wife was pregnant at the time and my dad mentioned how my mum had been at a similar stage of her pregnancy at the time of his 30th too. Most people would have left it there, but I immediately took out my phone and calculated the date that the birth needed to happen, lest we lose (laughs) this incredible coincidence. My son is uh, four now and I adore him in a way I can hardly express. No matter what he does, no matter who he becomes, no matter where he goes in life, I will stand behind him always and make sure he's happy, he's safe and he knows he's loved. That said, if he breaks this chain by failing to produce a firstborn on May the 1st, 2047, 
<laughs> then I will immediately cut him off forever. I don't think he would do this to me, but I've instructed my legal team to make preparations <laughs> just to be on the safe side. That's so great. I love that so much. That's awesome. Great fact, Aiden. Uh, love your work. I, we should also open up a new section, fact, quote, a question, or coincidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fact, quote, a question, or coincidence. <laughs> 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 It doesn't look. I'll, maybe I'll have to think of it. Could it be? Melody. Could it just be a sub something of, of, of a fact? fact. But yeah. if pe- if people are like, oh, I don't know what to write in with these things. If you can think of a sweet coincidence in your life or from history, I'd love to hear them. Count yeah. that as a fact. Uh, thank you very much, Aiden. The next one comes from Nick Fidian, whose title is Nickopedia dot <laughs> Oh, I love, <laughs> I love it. it. Very good. And Nick's also given us a fact. Here is his. Kleenex tissues were originally designed to be used for gas masks. When there was a cotton shortage during World War I, Kimberly Clark developed a thin, flat cotton substitute that the army tried to use as a filter in gas masks. The war ended before scientists perfected the material for gas masks, so the company redeveloped it to be smoother and softer, then marketed Kleenex as facial tissue instead. Huh. Wow, there you go. That's is, that's somewhere between f- uh, fun and grim. Yes. Yeah, because it's used for gas masks. Oh, I'm thankful. I love it. Love a tissue. You love them. Great. In America, because you know they talk in America, they just use Kleenex interchangeably with tissue. Yeah, yeah my grandmother did. Can that. I grab a Kleenex? Mm. Which is a bit of fun. They should also. What, do they mean gas mask? <laughs> Can I grab my gas mask? <laughs> Especially if your nana's saying it. <laughs> is, there, is there a term for that? If you. For those products that have sort of become synonymous or the brand name that's become oh. synonymous. Right, like Escalator. Escalator, Speedo. What? Yeah, this what is a brand. What? Also heroin. What's heroin? an Escalator called then? Yo-Yo. Moving Stairs, something like that. What? That's nuts. Dave, you're crazy. Bic? Bi- no, Biro is the one I'm thinking of, sorry. Biro. Older people and was refer to a pan as a biro. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 do, <laughs> yep. I do that. Yep. People older than me. <laughs> old, old. Is that an old? I didn't realize I was an old person. Thing, oh, I, I think you might have call them biros. My dad probably does. I call it a pen. Yeah, I'd probably say pen as well, but I, oh, okay. I wouldn't know what you mean if you say biro. I uh, call it an inky pencil. <laughs> <laughs> inky, ink stick. <laughs> An ink stick. Stat. Chuck is an instinct. Ink stink. Ink stink. <laughs> oh, fuck. Let's call it a bick. <laughs> Chuck is a bick. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, the next one comes from Roy Phillips, who's given himself the title of the Swiss Witch Witch Switched Witch Switch Wrist Watch. Oh, okay. Well, I feel like you nailed that. Yeah. I feel like you said a lot of the same words. I was never in control of it, but I feel, you know what I mean? You're like, yeah. I was panicking the whole way through. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I st- like, if that's, if, I don't know if it's always Roy, but someone else has tried to get me with these um, uh, tongue, tongue twisters, twisters before. I love it. And I don't, because I don't read them before I start. So I'm like... <laughs> Do you just I'm know like, it? oh no, oh no, I'm in now. Oh. It's probably the best way to do you it. it you, it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, now, Roy has asked a question. His question is, what's your favourite one-liner jokes? And he's given uh, his example. Well, I just thought of one. I don't. It's not quite a one-liner, but just based on the escalator, there's the, the joke. Escala- I'm going to fuck it up, but escalators... <laughs> Escalators don't break. <laughs> I don't reckon you fucked it up yet. I, I think I have. Uh, let me. Escalators don't break. Uh, let me find. It's a Mitch Hedberg joke that is often quoted, and it's so funny that I was. Uh, here we go. Uh, an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. You should never see an escalator temporarily out of order sign. Just escalator temporarily stairs. <laughs> Sorry for the convenience. <laughs> it's kind of a three liner, but still. That is good. good. That's fun. What about you guys? Uh, just remember, I used to love um, Dimitri Martin. Yeah. Yep. Jokes with a guitar. I'm trying to think of any of them. One, I love I, them. One of his, the, the one that comes to mind, he says something like. There's not a lot of difference between saying I'm sorry and I apologise until you're at a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Another one of his is talking about um, getting pyjamas with pockets, cause, which is great because I used to have to hold stuff while I slept. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I like that. 
What about Carl uh, uh, Chandler's famous joke? Um, I'm going to fuck this up as well. Something like... Um, <laughs> Um, is this a duck sandwich? Duck sandwich. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so like, They've Dum Dum Club fans love yeah, it. Something about duck sandwiches. Finally, the the duck so <laughs> the duck so close to the thing that it's always wanted, but <laughs> I can't. No, oh. <laughs> it's good, but I can't eat. Yeah. Mitch Hedberg had one as well about. <laughs> oh, Google it. Ordering a club sandwich, and I'm not even a member. I don't know how I got away with it. <laughs> it's <is> great. <laughs> it's great. Uh, Carl's is, and um, big shout out to Similar Carl to what Chandler. I said, though, obviously, and the delivery was pretty good for mine, but uh, you have your go. Like, and th- honestly, the fans of their podcast love it so much. Oh, if he's doing stand up, that it's his most requested joke, but it, duck sandwiches make me feel sad because they've finally got so close to the bread they love, but they're in no shape to eat it. Great work, That's Carl. Um, I've, what about Dimitri Martin? He's like, <laughs> I, uh, I bought a cactus, but it died. Good to know I'm less nurturing than a desert. <laughs> yeah. oh, That's good. Uh. Uh, oh, I, I should say this is from uh, Roy Phillips, and Roy's uh, he's answered his own question, which we always say. Love that, Roy. Good that. work. Uh, Roy's favorite is a Tim Vine joke. The adv- oh, I love him. He's great. The advantages of easy origami are twofold. <laughs> <laughs> I've Googled Tim Vine jokes and that's the one that comes up. Number one. Great work, Roy. That's a good one. I don't think about my favourite one-liners all that often. Why did the Taliban burn 10,000 copies of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon in a public square? Because it's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Um, Thanks, Roy. Apologies for the very poor impersonation there. Uh... All right. And uh, finally, from Tom Goodall, also a question. Tom's, qu- oh, sorry. Tom has given himself the title of Tester in Chief for Cream Viscosity for the Do Go On Scone. Oh, that's an important job. Or Do Go On Scone, depending on how you say it. You, you say scone or scone? Scone. 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 <laughs> oh, I sconed him. Uh, Tom's question is, do you guys ever come across topics that really interest you, have loads of material to work with, but you can't do them because they just won't work for comedic purposes? For context, the first episode I listened to was about Chernobyl, so I guess the list must be pretty small. Yeah, I reckon I reckon there are certain uh, serial killers that get suggested sometimes, yeah. and I'm just like, I, yeah. I don't think we can... We have lines that we draw there. It's just sort of like horrific stuff. Yeah. And we have done some pretty horrific ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I know. But so, there yeah. are just certain. Yeah, there's a level that I, I think. When I there's think we children got a, a involved, kind of a vibe no. for yeah, what our the majority of listeners don't want to hear about. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely some that you kind of go, oh, a bit too fucked, um, or hard, very hard to make funny. But we've that's through a bit of trial and error too. We've had some that we've gone, well, that was impossible to make fun. Yeah. And we don't do that again. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes people like, I, I notice in the hat will be like, this one's really fucked. And yeah. you go, oh, maybe not. Like, they're like, do one on human experiments in the Second World War. You're like, no, thanks. Yeah. I don't want to read that myself. <laughs> or, yeah, torture devices uh, from the 18th century. Oh, oh no. I don't, don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But. Yeah, so, but yeah, in terms of ones that would interest me, I think for the most part, if it interests me personally, then I assume that the listeners will be interested and I think I would be up for doing it. Yeah. If you're interested in it, you can generally make it interesting because you give a shit about it. Yeah. There, there's maybe there's some, like I once I did one at a live show about um, St. Kilda legend Tony Plugger Lockett. And as I was doing it, <laughs> <laughs> that one was really not, maybe just not a live. Studio one. Live in Manchester where they, yeah, they were have like, no idea what the game is. <laughs> yeah. They were looking at me real funny. Uh, Great story, though. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, that brings us to the section where we thank a few of our other great supporters on the Patreon. Um, Jess, you normally have a little game to play based on the topic. Oh, yeah. What do you reckon today? Um, what they take with them when trying to reach the summit of Everest. Oh, oh all right. Obviously, you can get a vacuum, oxygen. Photo of the miso. God, we've had <laughs> some fun riffs and I forgot about the vacuum. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget it now. 
I think this episode, more than anything, is being remembered for licking. <laughs> for what? Licking. Uh, so I'd love to thank first up from Benbrook in Texas, Jeremy Klein. Jeremy Klein. Jeremy Klein brought a recliner with him. <laughs> no. Yeah. What inspired that thought process? Comfort. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeremy Klein on the recliner. Like, like a full Lazy Boy setup? Yes! On wheels? <laughs> with a pulley system? Nah. Surround sound? So he has to, he has to carry it. Yeah. But? But worth it. When everyone goes not nice evening, and yeah. they're all curled up in the snow and he's in his recliner, he's Using like, a worth it. oxygen tank for a pillow. He's yes! like... <laughs> You little ripper. Yeah. BYO chairs. A ripper yeah. dipper. Yeah. Oh, nice one. Good work, Jeremy Klein, the recliner. Uh, I'd also love to thank from Hepburn in SK Canada, Saskatchewan. Do you reckon? I believe you'd be right. Yeah. A George W. Hembury. Oh, George. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Gorge. George? No, George. How are we going? What was it? <laughs> it started out. Je. I can't even think of what, how I... It, sound, it rhymed with... Because I kept thinking that at some point it was going to make sense that it rhymed with um, Scourge. I think it was... Jurge. Jurge. It was Jurge. Jurge. Jurge Herbert Lee. So what's uh, Jurge W. Hembry bringing? Uh, recorder. <laughs> Recliner or recorder? Oh. Recorder for and a... He's just playing My Heart Will Go On. Every night they're like... <laughs> Good, can you please learn another song? Oh I didn't my bring God. any sheet music with me. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that would go through cycles of being so funny <laughs> and then so annoying and back Can around. You imagine? They'd be like, there's no <laughs> oxygen up here and still you're able to play that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be crying tears. Those tears would be freezing. Crying tears of laughter. I didn't, didn't have to specify the tears. I'd be crying of, of blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on your... Uh, uh, Judge. Judge. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judgey Bidge. Uh, and finally, for me, I'd love to thank from Menominee <laughs> in <laughs> maybe Wisconsin in the United States, WI. Menominee. Menominee. WI, Wisconsin, Davo. I think so. I'd love to thank Ben Minder. Ben Minder. Dave brought a. Uh, a copy of. Uh, the best of Jerry Spring- Springer on DVD. Oh, wow! Just in case. Yeah, you want to you want to die with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Clutching Jerry Springer. Didn't didn't have a miso to bring a picture of, so we thought, who's the next best thing? <laughs> Jerry Springer. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry. Obviously. Can I touch Steve's head? <laughs> hey, Dave. Can I ask a quick quick question? Sure. Why does Colonel Sanders keep the eleven herbs and spices of Kentucky Fried Chicken's original recipe a secret? Why? Because he's ashamed of them. <laughs> it's a pretty similar stuff. joke to the other one, but it's still good. <laughs> hey, can I also thank some people? Yes. Thank you so much. I would love to thank, from Sheffield in Great Britain, Oof. Hannah Whelan. Hannah Whelan. Matt, what has Hannah Whelan Hannah brought up? Hannah Whelan and Dylan. She's bringing a collection of her business cards. Oh, yes. fantastic. She's, she's networking her way yeah. to the top. <laughs> you got to. Hey, the how are you? <laughs> hey, yeah. How are you? Oh, green boots. Hey, when you win these, oh, wow. There's never a time that you shouldn't be networking. A, B, N. Hey, can you uh, pull me up from this ledge? Sure, but first, let me let tell me you tell about you. my, uh, let me give you my elevator pitch. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, good for you, Hannah. And, uh, you know, keep keep hustling, girl. Keep hustling, girl. <laughs> I would also love to thank, from Malvern East, here in Victoria, I would love to thank Thomas Duncan. Thomas Duncan. Tom Dunk. Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, he obviously would bring his full baking kitchen setup. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Oven. Yep. What else do you have, uh, Mixing bowl. Yep, mix master. A uh, bag of flour. Heaps of flour. Uh, different size rolling pins. Yes. Uh, Small one. Big, big one, one. Medium. Yep. Back up big one. Maybe a baking tray. Baking tray. Uh, butter. Yes. Those little frilly things you put cupcakes in. Yeah. Yep. Patty pans. Thank you. Salt. Uh, a little sugar. Bit salt, sugar. Uh, sugar. Cho- chocolate. Yeah, a bit of chocolate. Uh, and of course, a knife, wine, sprinkles, sprinkle, and a proving tray. Yes, of Is course. Is that a thing? For bread. Proving drawer. Proving drawer. 
Yes. I've watched The Great Australian Bake Off. Have I ever told you how, how much I love it when they say something's got a really nice crispy snap or something? Can't remember what I was even saying. All right. <laughs> something like that. What is the thing that I like from that show? <laughs> The the crunch? crunch crunch crunch. Now I get what you're saying. Yeah, is that what you're talking about with, with Julia so. Child when you were hammered? Oh mate, come on! You were absolutely Thanks. sloshed. Don't throw me under the bus. You were. Blind, I had a dog up drunk. me. <laughs> a dog right up. Yeah. I had a dog deep up me. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you for you know baking lots of goods for your fellow uh, explorers. And finally, for me, I would love to thank uh, from Brisbane. In Queensland, Jack Taylor. Jack Taylor has brought in one of those mini umbrellas that you put in cocktails. Just one. Just one. Okay, what's well, he doing with it? Is that a lucky? It's lucky umbrella. Well, it might rain up there. Yeah, no, you're right. You're not well, wrong. You wouldn't want it to rain on your cocktail. Is, I mean, he's got a pina colada up there. You don't want to Is get... everything made of paper for Jack? Yeah. Oh, Jack's gonna die. <laughs> oh no. Sorry, Jack. Paper suit. You are dead. Paper Seven. mache. D e d dead. That's what one of my English teachers used to say. And then that's one, a Simpsons thing, isn't it? One girl in my class is like, that's not how you spell it. And I was like, you're going to go far in life. <laughs> to the teacher, because she couldn't spell. She was an English teacher. It's crazy. Oh, that it wasn't a bit she was doing. No, it was definitely a bit. Uh, <laughs> From the Simpsons, right? Maybe. Is it? Am I making that up? It definitely could be. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, Dave, over to you. I would love to thank three beautiful people. And I've, uh, pop people. I've edited them. They are absolute A grade. Hotties? Absolute hotties. These Hell ones. yeah. I'd like to thank, not their value, but still, wow. From Woolowin in Queensland, Max Callahan. Back to back Queenslanders. What do you reckon? Max, the axe, Callahan will, of course, have brought a circular saw. Oh, fantastic. Perfect. For cutting through the ice. Which I read today on International Women's Day was invented by a woman. Wow. Circular saw. No, that's very cool. There is literally, literally nothing we can't do <laughs> other than pee standing up, but we try. <laughs> Haven't you heard of the sheepy? Eh? Mm, I have, but they uh, are often made of paper. They just disintegrate. Oh, that is something that just got Jack Taylor's attention. <laughs> <laughs> I would now like to thank from, you're going to love this, from Dawson Creek. What? In British Columbia and Canada. Cassie Haywood. Cassie, Cassie Haywood. Haywood from Dawson Creek. She's more of a Dawson or a Pacey kind of gal. I don't know. Who are you, Jess? Dawson or Team Pacey? Um, I never Aren't watched. they friends? Yeah. What? You Why would they have one? different teams? Dawson. Because Joey was going to end up with one or the Dawson. other. Dawson. Pacey was the only one that was on the Mighty Ducks. Pacey's a stupid name. Pacey. I'm Team Pacey. And uh, Casey Haywood has brought with... I'm Team Michelle Williams. Hockey stick. Oh, okay. From the band Destiny's Child. You are a Michelle Williams. Yeah, you're a Michelle. Hockey stick, is that for self-defense or yeah. for playing a game up there? Both. First one to smack a puck off the top of yeah. Man of Bruce. That'd be cool. That'd be very cool. If you could, I wonder if anyone's ever hit a golf ball off the top. Surely. If you'd be allowed. That's, sure, that's going to kill someone. Surely you'd be up there going, oh, I've got energy to have a full <laughs> swing. <laughs> swing. Let's play nine. <laughs> play, nine. play 18. Let's do it. Let's party. Thanks, Cassie Haywood. Well, you know, I'm, I've, I'm carrying all the essentials, including my 14 clubs. <laughs> I don't right. know which club <laughs> I want to select. There. Oh, my God. I didn't want a seven. <laughs> I would like to thank from, finally, from Fitzroy in Victoria, Jojo Mullen. Jojo Mullen. Jojo which is Zepp and the Falcons. Maybe uh, bringing pet falcon bird. Who oh, fantastic. He's got a, um, it's a really smart, Jojo uh, Mullen's got a really smart pet falcon bird. Okay. Who um, can sort of like seek, search ahead and comes back and it can talk. It says, oh, hi, Jojo. <laughs> I've looked up ahead. Let's go. Go. Coast it clear. Clear. I love it. Birds have, because they don't have the same, they don't have human mouths, they speak slightly differently. So you're okay. at, at the side of their beak. Yeah, at yeah. the side of their beak. Makes sense. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much, Jojo Mullen. Thank you to Jojo, Cassie, Max, Jack, Thomas, Hannah, Ben, and George, and Jeremy. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you so much for your support, you bloody legends. Uh, that only leaves us with uh, welcoming some people into the Triptych Club, which is the very exclusive club that we uh, we're members of. I think we we're actually the first three members of it. Oh yeah, I think so. Founding, um, founding. Fathers. I think I was actually the first member, and then. Uh, a couple of episodes later, Jess came in, and then I think Dave brought up the rear. And then we started bringing in uh, other members who've been supporting us since the uh, for three years on the shout out level. And the way this normally works is I'm standing on the door, I got a clipboard, I read out their names, then Dave hypes them up. You feel you're coming into the club, you're feeling good. Oh, you are hot. Dave normally has quite a, like a bad plan words based on your city of whoa, residence. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. Hmm. Jess, did you hear what? You hear that? He said bad. What do you mean? Do you mean bad as in like Michael Jackson? Bad. I'm bad. I'm really, really bad. Do you mean like that? Say it. No, I, no I'm not, not as bad as Michael Jackson. I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying you're doing any sort of felonies, but um, you are allegedly. Okay. But um, <laughs> what I'm saying is, uh, you know, isn't that the point? They're kind of not very good, and that's why you didn't get me to do them. What? Because you didn't want them. Wait, I'm confused. You so jealous of Dave. My God, I've got a talent. He's gifted. I'm sorry. What is, what's going on? Get over it. The fact that Dave has something oh, you have, going Sorry for him. that you've got the boring job of just reading out a name. Sorry about and that. And that I hype him up and Jess hypes me up. Yes. We've so got a, anyway, I mean, I was getting to that. Dave we've, hypes we've him a, up poorly and then Jess does her best to make Dave feel good about no, it. No, no, oh no. Oh, my God. We are a classic combination. And then, anyway, uh, prior to that, Dave's also booked a band. Uh, usually, because he has to book it in advance, even though there are opportunities for <laughs> the band to be linked nicely to the topic, Dave often gets it wrong. But uh, Jess also gets to uh, organise some food and drinks. What do you got this week, Jess? Um, this week we have uh, little mini um, umbrellas to go in everything, obviously, oh, like fantastic. Dave was just saying. Um, but food-wise, we have nachos. In the shape of a mountain. Oh, great. Yeah. I love nachos. And you can die. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 4% chance. Just to give you that Everest experience. Yeah, there's a good chance wow. you will Four die. Four in 100. What's yeah. that? One in 25 will be deadly. Yes. You're okay. lacing one in 25 with poison. No. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And Dave, what, who have you booked? Well, uh, good at this. I had booked uh, Snow Patrol. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> look, I uh, didn't want to stab myself in the ears, so I sent them home and <laughs> DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Oh, fantastic. Boom, shake the room. So here we go, here we go, here we, here we go, yo. Now, I'm going to be reading out the name, then Dave's going to do his best. I didn't realise he was doing his best. I, th- I honestly thought he was purposely doing it poorly. But What are you talking what about? What are you talking about? It's so embarrassing that you don't get it. Okay, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to this now. This is Dave doing these good high. How many have you got? Three. Easy. Rule of three, Dave. Three Pete. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm just warming up. <laughs> I hear a word and I, I turn it into something else. Yeah. That's what I do. I hear words and I turn them into something what else. He does, man. Fuck, it's, it's a your, play. It's your, it's your gift. Life is a play. Yes. I'm an actor. Yeah. Okay. I'm, All the world's a stage. Yes, I'm reading the script. But I'm making up the show. I'm flipping the script. Yeah. Wow. Right, I'm ready. Oh, he's in. I'm ready. Yeah, he's, he's pumped himself up. All again. right. So uh, I'd love to welcome these three in. <laughs> uh, Jess, I'm going to need you. Please <laughs> no, no. grab some nachos if you're feeling brave um, and uh, grab a drink. Uh, and enjoy it. Jazzy Jeff. And I've also got show. a drink in the shape of a mountain. Wow. Love that. Love Very that. Very good. Uh, okay. So first up, I'd love to welcome into the Triptych Club from Preston in Victoria, Australia. Impressed. It's David Potsy Cunningham. I'm feeling in Preston. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. David, love you. You ain't, a, you ain't no Potsy. That's my backup. Is, Dave, yeah. that is the best one you've ever done on this. How did you, you come up with that? Compliment, I'll take it. Thank you. Uh, this next one uh, from Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. It's Joshua Peel. I can see the appeal yes. of letting you in, Josh. Fucking hell. <laughs> two for two. <laughs> yes. That's funny. New, new listeners are going to be like, it's pretty bad, but it's not as bad as Matt was making out. But this is actually Dave's about? best go at it so far. You're ruining the momentum again. We've talked and about doing this. <laughs> and finally. This is going to be great. I've just lost it now. So finally from Sheffield in South Yorkshire, Great Britain, it's Alexandra Rogers Brassington. 
A lot, a lot to work this with here. Is, I've got to tell you, this is absolutely top brass yes. in terms. Top brass. Yes. Thank you. This what, this is top brass. What does that mean? I'm pointing to the uh, to Alexandra. This You're is top calling brass. Alexandra this. She's top brass. Okay. Kington. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. That's uh, Dave doing his best. Woo! Thank you so much. I would only ever give my best in anything I ever do. Yep. And I, I excel at everything I ever do. <laughs> Just ask my my uh, teammates on my tennis team from 2003. And that brings us to the end of the episode, I think. People can find us on all the social medias at DugonPod. DugonPod.com is our website. If you want to support us, like we said, you can go there or go to patreon.com slash DugonPod. You can find us at our own addresses. Just send me a message and I will give them out willingly. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> you got to stop saying that because people do send the messages. <laughs> um, you can also see us live in concert. Yeah, uh, we're doing four Dugo on shows, like we said at the top of the podcast, and the one-off book cheat and primate shows are on sale. That is Sunday, April fourth. We can see all three podcasts plus plus Matt's stand-up show in the same day. Plus, we'll even let you have time for a meal break. Dave, I just had a great idea. One day we've got to do a live show with a house band. I would love that so much. How fun would that be? That would be so fun. Can we make that happen? No, I'm looking. <laughs> Jess, Absolutely Jess, not. you work in the music biz. Come on, you can probably no. get someone. Who do you, could you get the Veronicas or someone to I be our be yes. band? Could we get the Veronicas? I could, but I won't. Damn it! Yeah, damn it! I will not get the Veronicas. Could you get the either. Chats? Yes, I could. What about the but Chats? I what won't. about Skegs? I could get Skegs, but I won't. Uh, Jess Perkins here on Triple J. Coming up, we've got the latest from <laughs> Skegs. Mm-hmm. What's we it love called? music here, at Triple J. The latest from Skegs called Valhalla. Oh, New album Hella. coming out in a couple of weeks. The, Vi- uh, the Viking Afterlife. That's right. The Great Hall. Wow, I'm learning so much on this podcast. Valhalla, great uh, beer pub in Geelong. Ah. Make their own beer. The more, you know, in summary, we hope to see you on April 4th for the beer extravaganza. But until next week, I'll say thank you so much for listening. And until then, goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye.